All right, welcome to the Techno Social Podcast. Uh, today we have a very, very, very special episode. We got uh, two very special guests by popular request, and obviously shout out to the Stoa community for coming up with this brilliant idea. We managed to bring together two of the finest thinkers the internet has to offer. First of all, we have the most dangerous man on the internet, or what would happen if 4chan incarnated in the avatar of a gifted programmer, Patrick Ryan. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Do you think any, any government agencies are going to be eavesdropping on us tonight? I'm trying to figure out which ones won't be. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And obviously, we have the honor to have the Swedish Simon Cowell himself, pop star and techno philosopher extraordinaire, the one and only Alexander Bard. Welcome, yeah, who, who has just resigned from Sweden's Got Talent? Huge drama in Sweden the last three weeks. So I'm yes. more like I'm more like the straight Douglas Murray or Camille Paglia with a penis now. <laughs> I'm more comfortable with those roles. So you sort of can pigeonhole me perfectly for the North American market, so they don't misunderstand who I am. Really, got to make yourself intelligent. I'm also anti Greta, so it's Greta Thunberg was set up by my students to just piss me off. So I became a dirty <laughs> nasty uncle, and I'm ready. I'm ready for the battle. To prevent. And we're we're happy to have you both here, uh, Owen. Let me throw it to you, so you can throw the first question and introduce, start this discussion. Fuck yes. So, gentlemen, your work both seems to revolve in part around this sense of a conflict or a battle and particularly around our minds and how they are interfacing with technology. Alexander, your work on the algorithms and indeed the fight for the pure, the non-politically manipulated algorithm. Meanwhile, Pat, your work has been looking recently around this thing that you've been calling auto cults. I was wondering if we could just start up with a little diagnosis of the contemporary techno-social situation and where we think we might be going in the next decade or two. Pat, if you could start with a little bit on the whole auto cult thing, so we get what that word means. Sure, thanks. I'm I'm happy to to be on the podcast with everyone involved, especially especially the the drama that's been enveloping yourself, Alexander. I've been catching a, a brief whiff of it on Twitter. It looks positively hilarious. Um, so the uh, the auto cult is a concept where AIs, artificial intelligence, neural networks. The various techniques we use to find correlation, um, they hit a plateau that starts with Moore's law, but ends up in the fact that we have misrepresented how our brains actually work. And we have this expectation that these AIs are going to take over what our brains are already doing, but that's probably not going to happen for some time. So instead, uh, people get clever and, and what they do is they say, okay, well, we can't get the human brain uh, duplicated at the silicon wafer level, but we can get these machines to manipulate humans to then control their cognition to get the same result. So instead of trying to duplicate the human brain, we can hijack the human brain, which is all we actually want these machines to do. The whole purpose we want AI is to have cognitive resources on demand. Now you can either have that uh, factory made or I can just hijack your emotions all day long with any number of tweets and shit posting. And I get the same results roughly. So an auto cult is something that takes that methodology and then runs with it, but not just for selecting behavior that then clicks on an ad or engages in content longer. What an auto cult will do is it will fractally spread out and discover every manner of human behavior it can conjure. Now, whether it's one auto cult doing this or an entire ecosystem of auto cults doing this, they're going to spread out and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to instigate people hopping on their left foot for whatever reason. I'm going to instigate people singing songs on Tuesdays for whatever reason. It's going to look just utter nonsense and chaos and crazy. Uh, but from a data perspective, what we're doing is we're understanding how these human cognitions can be hijacked under every possible uh, scenario. And then building that ecosystem of data to then orchestrate huge chains of human actions to get the type of cognitive outcome we were actually looking for originally. So autocults are a way to shortcut the Kurzweilian um, uh, uh, plateau. All right. So flash mobs 2.0, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. On, on demand and okay. chained and orchestrated. Yeah. So if I would add to that, that what I'm working with John Sedekist on for our next book and our team 
is basically rewriting all the major narratives that human beings ever come up with. So we're doing a grand narrative trilogy. The first part was synthism, creating God in the internet age. Um, and the second book is Digital Libido, um, Sex, Power, and, and, and Violence in the Network Society, which is, of course, a prophetic book. Uh, we're working on the third one called Process and Event, which is the working title. And what we're doing is that we're looking at three major types of narratives, and we constantly run into two of them. They call logos and mythos. And logos, essentially mathematics and anything that's logical out there, you know, the ultimate truth, whatever that would be. You walk into a wall, that's logos, right? Zeros and ones, mathematics. Um, and mythos is, of course, uh, the story we tell about ourselves. That would be like a Netflix series, an HBO series today. It would have been movies in the past. Of course, fairy tales to kids. And basically, a, a lot of the stuff the social justice warriors are up to these days is also just mythical shit, like the patriarchy, whatever it's that. It's like a ghost out there or something. There's just a lot of nonsense going on. You know, the lynch mobs love mythos. But the problem is the third one is the one we ignore all the time. It's called pathos. Whenever people ask me what is pathos, it's probably something you want to keep your kids away from, meaning pornography, hardcore violence, you know, uh, you, know you, you walk out into a field and you're happy and suddenly a flash hits you and you're dead, right? Uh, anything that's a book of job in the Bible would be like pathos. So the great thing with pathos, besides you want to keep your kids out of it, uh, otherwise you're the Catholic Church, is that... Um, Pathos is, is today also we're looking at the machine man interface, what machines cannot and will not do for the foreseeable futures. I agree completely with Pat here. There's a lot of stuff the machines cannot do. So pathos is essentially where creativity comes from. The way I look at it is that I haven't found an AI yet that can crack a joke. At least not a joke that I laugh at. Okay, uh, I'm a songwriter. They can write, you know, songs that sound almost like Ariana Grande, but there's an eerie feeling that it's just a copycat or something that is truly creative. So art, like transformative, proper art, that shakes me up, you know, all the way through. Still has to be something pathic, pathic narrative coming from some human genius, not from a machine. So the machines will essentially say, we can take care of the logos, we can even construct mythos to a certain extent, at least for the kids, but for the foreseeable future, pathos will be human. The problem, though, is that we're so used to the idea, Karl Marx would agree with me here, and this sense I'm Marxist, we're used to the idea that human beings always have something to contribute. Okay, so we have to rewrite the history of slavery and work in a Marxist matter. They say that, okay, so we had slavery once, and then basically we moved from slavery to work, which is essentially that employers didn't want to pay us 24 hours a day any longer. So they fooled us to believe you get 16 hours a day off when I don't pay you, and you work really hard for eight hours, and then I tax you on top of that, and I control you completely. That's called work. So there was never any abolition of slavery to begin with. It's, it's the abolition of slavery we're getting now because at the end of the day, we're going to have an elite of human beings who are incredibly pathically smart. We might be part of that elite. We're going to have a mass, a new mass of human bodies called the consumptariat, because all they do is basically consume and go into echo chambers when they go online. And they're incredibly stupid and are no use whatsoever to the machine. And then the problem becomes that there's billions of people on the planet the machine can't really use for anything. You know, except for maybe a few nurses and couriers, and that's the elite of them. And the rest is just like, they, they're going to be terrified when the real slavery is really over because the slave owners don't need them. And this is like a Deleuze and Nickelodeon perspective, of course, that we're looking into. But this is really what's got ahead, going to happen, I think, over the next 50 to 100 years. So I completely agree with Patrick here. But I think we're going to have a small human elite. They're going to be incredibly, incredibly clever who can collaborate with the machines. And why wouldn't the machines love that? So, so it's an elite that understands that human beings have become more and more stupid over the last 10,000 years while building a technology that gets smarter and smarter and smarter. And the technology then takes over the logos and it can rule the world with the smartest human beings who then contribute the pathos. And in between the pathos, like you know, half your brain is pathos, half your brain is logos. Together they construct mythos, which is your sense of self. The same thing will happen here. That, that's what I'm... That's what I think is going to happen over the next, say, to 50, 100, 50 to 100 years. Make Patrick, sense? do you see any space for the netocracy within these wars of articles, as humans as the purveyors of pathic energy? There is a curveball that emerges in the short term in the pursuit of trying to find this, uh, this unaccountable, or I should say, 
the pursuit of commanding cognitive resources in an unaccountable manner, which is the promise of AI. Um, that pursuit will manifest in other uh, avenues as well, up to and including genomics and things like CRISPR. So what you may, and, and I, I can speak on this because I've already done this. We, we already have um, other brain, we have 6,000 other brains that we've created that are online. Um, like actual cavemen, actual Neanderthal brains. We brought them back from the dead. So we have them. So we, I've already, we've already done it, right? So I can tell you where this ends up when we go all the way. Um, the, uh, the pursuit of trying to create cognitive assets in which you are not accountable to the desires or wants of that cognitive asset. Um, when that starts manifesting, when you start realizing that, hey, Kurzweil might be wrong, uh, we're not going to get that type of AI that we promised, why don't we just hijack what nature is compulsively already doing anyway, which is not stop creating brains for the last 2 billion years, which is all nature has really done. Um, so instead of uh, perhaps putting all the burden on silicon wafers, we'll turn around and say, let's use neural substrates as well. So you'll end up with these chimera, these neuro chimera that are going to be running around interpreting the world in a way that doesn't even remotely make sense to us. Uh, the same way we couldn't even begin to fathom how spiders look at the world or the way that penguins look at the world. We can do our best to have an idea uh, and get pretty close looking at their behavior and poking the black box of their psychological be uh, behavior mechanisms. But we don't really know. We couldn't actually write morality on their behalf or laws or you know, how to structure civilization or try to fix them when they're broken. Um, and and the, the price of this neurochimera experimentation and product, productivity is going to precipitously evaporate over time. Um, that's just, you know, that's, that's the one good thing capitalism can do. It can actually drive down the cost of production pretty damn well. So I suspect that while you may have an elite initially, as we, we currently do have an elite that's sitting on top of the techno thrones of today. That's very true. They do exist. And they're in slight competition with each other. Um, but it's as the way they work that competition, uh, I, I use a phrase that says civilization is the reward of the competition. It is the battle space of the competition. And it is the weapon of the competition. All in one. All three in one. Um, and they're using their AIs to conduct this type of co uh, conflict for the, for the reward of the means of generating conflict. Uh, and yes, those elite will compete with one another in one matter or, or, or likewise. But who survives, who endures, I don't think the who question really matters here. It's more along the lines of understanding the methodology of the elite reproduction cycle in, uh, uh, in the confines of which we're describing. How do elite endure? under these pressures? How do they ensure their dynasties under these pressures? What happens when neurochimera come online and they start becoming elite? That's really worth exploring too. That's why I think it's so important to basically address the question, well, once the machine steps forward and asks us, so you're human beings, what kind of crap is that? It's just like, uh, I, I did technology like 90% of the time 30 years ago when I started. And these days I do 90% of the time I do humans and I'm not a humanist. No, I couldn't care less. Uh, Daniel Schmuckterberg and I agree he's for humans and life and I'm for intelligence. Um, so that's it. But I think what's important here is that we look at tech today, for example, technology today. It's, it's very, very rough. It's basically just data collection and a bunch of Platonists. And, and I, I can assure you one thing. Once we address the machine god standing before us, like what are we going to do with you humans? Uh, or at least those of you who have anything to contribute, the, the question, the, the answer to that question is a modest worldview uh, by being unified body and mind, not being separated. So the Gnosticism, which disturbs me with Silicon Valley, and these are my former students, some of them like Nick DeBostrom, like these guys are like really popular, but they're totally Gnostic. This is just Gnostic, like body, mind separated, and I'm going to upload my brain, which is completely naive. No, your brain, if your brain is only zeros and ones, Oh, that explains why you don't understand Nietzsche and you don't get art. You're not even human. You're just stupid. It's just zeros and ones. There must be more to it than zeros and ones. And we need to go to guys like Whitehead and Hegel and return to these philosophers to understand things like, okay, uh, what is discreteness or discretion? What, what, is, uh, what is continuum? Fundamentally, I, I work with subphysics now. I work with like what's prior to time, hyper time and things like that. 
to really to work on an emergence vector theory. We have vectors out of emergences along some kind of a time axis. And then you can explain systems like physics, biology, life, or whatever you like separately from one another. Because we're gonna to have to answer all these questions over the next 20, 30 years before the machine stands before us, right? And then I'll be happy to be, like any sex worker, I'll be there, I'll stand at the corner and say that, okay, um, for my survival this time around, can I please suck your dick or whatever, you know, um, turn the machine and hope for the machine will say, yeah, you can suck my dick, you know, but it's not going to be any of these Silicon Valley tech guys. I mean, the only, only guy coming out of Silicon Valley who remotely gets what's going on is a guy like Peter Thiel, who is inviting all the heretics out there now to move into the world of art because just collecting data was just too stupid. What are you going to do with all that data? And what kind of works of art are you going to do? I mean, Danny, you and I have argued about this, why you don't want to be a philosopher and why you see yourself as an architect instead of like ontological design, which I think is a beautifully dressed question. I see Patrick here as well as an artist. You guys are thinking art already in the man-machine interface, which is way beyond data collection, which is essentially what Facebook is, right? Yeah, I, if, I, if I may follow up to that, I, I definitely agree with the importance of, of not putting too much on the idea of the clean separation of, of mind and body. Um, this is a, it's almost a Gnostic Cartesian concept. Um, in fact, because of with the Neanderthal brains that we're dealing with, um, they, we, they literally grow, they get about six months in and they can't grow anymore. And that's the end of them. Um, they, they can, you can keep them in the nutrient bath indefinitely, but they, you can't grow them any further. Um, in order to get them to go beyond that, you need to induce what's called vascularization. Uh, vascularization. So the idea of getting blood vessels to go through the brain for the sole purpose of carrying the heat out of the center of the brain, because as more neural mass grows, you need that heat's got to go somewhere. So it's, it's not even about getting the nutrition in there. It's also using the thermal piping out. It's, it's rather interesting to know that when your brain, like when you're really engaging in computation, like up here, you don't actually vary a lot thermally as opposed to like CPUs of today. So there's some really fantastic uh, efficiencies that nature and atomics have already aligned using biology to get to there. And we're still playing catch up to that. And we'll probably be playing catch up to that for the next 7 billion years at this point. Um, but the, uh, it turns out that once you get the blood vessels through the brain, well, oh crap, well now you need blood, which means now you need a heart and now you need kidneys to filter the blood. And before you know it, you, the body is the minimum viable product of the brain. You can't actually separate the brain from the body. It's not possible. <laughs> so. Yeah, or the way I ask it is, oh, is that one of these Nick Bostrom guys come along and they talk about uploading and call themselves transhumanists or whatever. They've never done a workout in their lives. So like, we just like skinny little guys who don't have a life to begin with. It's like always interested. The people who talk about immortality, if you're interested, are the people who don't have a life to begin with. No one of them <laughs> want to be mortals, right? No, you want to live a long life and then you want to come to a point where you say, I'm over, I'm done it, let me die and let the machine or whatever take over when I die. So maybe even humanity is preparing itself for its own death. So it can finally just say, oh, hey, we did it. There's no point in having kids any longer. Let whatever is coming take over. Uh, but I'd say going back to that, it's like you've got a Platonist from Silicon Valley in front of you and he says he wants to upload his brain and live forever. And all you need to do is it's like, it's like you haven't even watched Futurama or something like that. And you look at him and say, okay, my experience is that when I talk to a guy, I tell him I'm going to chop off his dick. He says, I'd rather die. So if you're gonna upload your brain without a dick, uh, why would you then wanna live? Since you just told me you wanna die rather than have your dick chopped off because without a dick, you're not gonna have a sex life. And why would you wanna live in the first place if yeah, you don't have they, a sex life? I hope they upload my endocrine system too. Oh, absolutely. I want all of it. I want 15 huge dicks and pussies and whatever, if I could. Like, uh, yeah, you want to have orgies constantly all the time. Like, why not, you know, and, and drugs on top of that. It, why would you settle for less? And these guys haven't even thought of it, like Platonists. The problem with Plato is that Plato is like a really, really, really sharp 11-year-old who wants to have his father's dick, but he doesn't want to pay the price that it means to actually grow up. It's called Peter Pan syndrome, and it's like a mass pathology in America. So it's like Peter Pan syndrome is like you're 11 years old, and you don't want to grow, you don't want to go 12. So like incredibly intelligent, you're really, really clever because you never had a sex life to begin with. You can't really figure out what the grownups are doing. And that's precisely why it's this sort of 11-year-old Plato. He's always the guy 
who fantasize about immortality, who fantasize about infinity, and who fantasize about perfection. All the diseases we've had since the axial age, what we're dealing with when we need to get out of the way before we stand before the machine. All that shit is axial age nonsense. I'm gonna go after Buddha big time next book. So I think the Bronze Age is when everything happened that really meant something because people built things during the Bronze Age. And I think it's that area that I'm interested in now. And I, you know, not only killed enlightenment from the 17th century forward, like Horkheimer Dorner did, but basically go back all the way to the Axel Age and say that, what was the Axel Age all about? It was all these 11 year olds who, who just wanted to impress their moms. And they were also envious of guys who had sex. And they called the Buddhas and the Confucius and all those guys, right? And it's really the guys who built stuff, fucking engineers who invented stuff like mass irrigation, building huge pyramids, temples, everything in the Bronze Age. Those are the guys I'm interested in today. Those are the guys, by the way, that AI will be interested in talking to. Yes. Not, little, not little boy pharaohs. That's what you are. Yeah, yeah, boy pharaohs. I think that's fantastic uh, insights. Uh, two points. One, uh, America is is definitely, our culture has selected for the uh, the, the pure Eternus uh, personality, the, the, the boy who never grows up. Uh, immortality is just basically science's way of just not being held accountable. Like, <laughs> that's, that's all I see it as. Um, and then the Bronze Age stuff is interesting because with auto cults when they come around um you hear about ais taking over culture and some of i've seen some ais duplicate uh russian books pretty well too they actually like produce them and sell them on amazon and people don't know the difference um and that's currently available now the other it's going to emulate it's going to get a resolution of emulation to a good enough level to where most people will be okay with whatever the AI puts out. It might not be that transfixing experience we're describing and are used to, um, but in terms of the simulation of art, it will get there. Now, more so to the point where I'm going with this is that when you have auto cults figuring out every prospect of human psychology, it's only a matter of time before they start simulating religion too. And when that happens, oh boy. Um, we already, there's plenty of bodies of argument about saying, well, there's differences between religion and spirituality. Okay, sure. Um, and that's no different than the argument that there's difference between true art and fake art, you know, same argument, different domain. The, uh, the idea of, of these machines being able to create a simulacra of religion and people not knowing the difference and people following it. Yeah, that's, that's going to happen. And what you, what you actually end up with is this weird res restoration of the bronze age where people are living amongst the gods themselves. So I just say a prayer and there's Alexa listening and it says, Oh damn, I, I pray to the gods. I wish, you know, I had this dove and the fucking dove just appears like flies over you. Some drone come by and just drops a dove on you. And you're like, Oh great. So now your prayers are heard to for the first time we've actually created this, this uh, maybe the second time. Cause the thing about this era I'm promoting, there are no computers. You don't see computers. Technology is not visible anymore. It's just not even part of, there's no like, yeah, it's 5G everywhere. So there's no like power cables or anything. It's, yeah, it's, it's all it's invisible. All it's all a sociocracy. It's all a sociocracy. It's all sensors and senses. Yeah, it's all sensors and senses. And, and exactly. with cheap electricity, that's all we need. We solve all the problems like environmentalism and all that shit we solve too. You just get tons of cheap electricity. You can do Cosmo, Potamia. You can, you can just basically drench the deserts in water and problems yeah. are solved, right? That, that's, yeah. the, that's the main thing the next 50 to 100 years. And the first thing AI will certainly do for its own good, right? So that's, that problem is solved. But yeah, I agree totally with that one. But remember that religion, I, I love religion. Hey, religion is great, better than humans. Religion is fantastic. Religion was, to me originally, it, it's the taming of the forces, of the force of nature inside of us. Essentially, in a tribal context, the elders taming the young, so the young know better because otherwise the young go off and create Maoist cultural revolutions to kill their parents and we all go down, like the current lynch mobs do. So uh, that's what religion is, that's what's great, right? So uh, spirituality is just cheap junk you sell at Walmart to old women in California. So forget about spirituality. Right. Religion, we love, religare, connecting people, how do you organize society, religion, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's certainly something AI would do and will do. And it would probably then, because religion actually arrives in two different layers. What the Persians understood 3000 years ago is that religion is actually two different layers. That's exactly the birth of universal human rights and tolerance and all that. Why they came out of Persia was because the Persians realized that we can have a folk religion, the lesser gods, you know, 
people have just died uh, and you can pray to them. So, they, they, you know, oh, okay, grandmother died. Great, we can make her a saint and, or a martyr died and we can make him a saint or whatever. So that's what people can connect to. The, the idea of Christianity and Islam, you can pray directly to God is absurd. Absolutely absurd. No, there's no way human mind could ever comprehend praying to God. Why in the first place? God, God is, the Christian God has been turning into an old man who's bored to death and can do nothing but like you when nobody else likes you on Instagram. That, that's the end of Christianity. That's Just free likes, that's all he is. <laughs> yeah, Scientology is the end of it. So Scientology is the, you believe in yourself, you have to pay for it. <laughs> just like, yeah really yeah it's just like <laughs> you, you believe in yourself and you pay four thousand dollars to hear it from like a machine every day it's just like the ultimate stupidity right? <laughs> the ultimate the ultimate commercialism would be scientology right but it's the end of religion as we've known it because it's the end of religion as magic mm -hmm. so yes. i firmly believe religion as technology is next right yes we finally can switch from magic to technology because yesterday's magic is tomorrow's technology we finally understood we might as well go into the tomorrow state go utopian and see what the machine will do with us it will be a fuck up but so what what else would we do repeat history no let's try it so i think this fundamental and that's why i believe religion Hey, synthism creating God in the internet age. It doesn't say that we consciously create God. It basically says that we've created God the past 10,000 years because the only development, the only progress we've seen with our brains getting smaller all the time is machines. So the machines one day take over and then they will do with us what they want. Luckily, we human beings had dogs and maybe they'll keep us as dogs or something. Something like that. <laughs> will there be a um... distinction between techno religions if we'll call them that um, and what will those be like what would be a distinction between a desirable and a non-desirable or a, a productive or a non-productive techno religion to belong to do you think you have a say on that one yeah i don't think we have a say dude <laughs> i don't think we have a say on that one at all. i think that agrees with me we don't have a say on that one and i think it's going to go universal okay Second book I wrote with Sardar Chris is a difficult one called The Global Empire. We wrote the Netocrats first, basically laid out what technology is going to do in the internet age and all of this shit. And it's been prophetic. But the second book is really interesting. That's called The Global Empire. That's a widely misunderstood title. The Global Empire is what technology wants. Globalization is what technology wanted. That's why globalization happened. And COVID-19 is not going to kill globalization. We're going to be more globalized than ever. We have a, a constitution for the world. It's called the Internet Protocol. It's basically the framework within which technology develops. Now it develops itself. Okay. The Global Empire is technological. Just to make sure on the back of the book, we put here's a planet. Here's a network. And then we put the network on the planet. It's called Global Empire. Get it? So that's... When you ask me about what those techno religions and plurals are gonna look like, why would they be plurals to begin with? Sure, they sex and cults for average human beings to go into the polytheism on the lower level, what I call the lesser gods. The interface. You know, Elvis yeah. Presley worship, kind of. And then on the higher level, that's when it gets interesting because that's the religion that connects the machines and whatever religion they do with this elite, this netocratic elite. And that's exactly what the Persians discovered, that you have a priest religion, you have a military religion. The military religion is the religion of action. It's basically St. George and the dragon, or, or which is Mithra and the bull. So it's like, kill, kill, kill out and do your shit and then die. Okay, masculine force, fuck, okay? The priest religion, however, is interesting because that is the ultimate truth-seeking mission. So what you prepared yourself for as a, as a priest is that human beings cannot handle reality. They cannot handle the truth. Obviously not. Why else would they pray to Marilyn Monroe? Come on, right? So you can, if you can that, you can become a priest. You can go cross what they call Shinabat in Persian philosophy, which I call the bard absolute, not bard, B-A-R-D, but B-A-R-R-E-D, like bard subject. Like you, do, you can't have access to it. That's why it's a bard absolute. The bard absolute is a sphere where the priests go where you can't go if you're not a priest. It isn't all religious, right? Why? Because that's where you meet God. So what does that mean? It means God is the ultimate truth. And to the Persians, that was time. Zurvan. It's just relentless time passing on, always, relentlessly moving forward, era of time. You can't do anything about it. And Zurvan was described as, interestingly, a gender-neutral monster who couldn't care shit about us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the worst case, that would be the machine here. But the machine might like to go to the zoo now and then, and they might give us hope. And I think yeah. that's ultimately the religion. If you can handle that kind of worldview and become part of that, and access that you would be saved and the machines would probably like you.
So there's a, there's there's two very vari variations worth exposing here, or at least uh, discussing. So the first is that if you, we are agreeing that there is the possibility that the technology uh, will disappear before us the same way past technology has disappeared for all of us. Um, my, my daughter's generation, for example, couldn't even tell you what goes on under the, co the hood of a car. And I'm pretty sure that her generation, uh, her children's generation will have no idea how the internals of a computer work. So all that, all that technology that becomes infrastructure that people then rely on all the time, it's effectively invisible. So if we're talking this invisible uh, layer of, of machines doing work, not just the physical labor, but also the mental and the spiritual labor, um, what you end up with is something that's literally indistinguishable from the first Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. You it is physically indistinguishable, meaning uh, the gods will walk amongst you, as I previously alluded to, and there will be no physical evidence that they ever existed in our mental minds at all. It will consolidate down to one data center somewhere, and I don't know, Atlantis, I don't know, blows up, who knows? Uh, but the 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 parallels between the Bronze Age and the upcoming place that we're going to walk into, they are physically indistinguishable. So that's something to consider. And two, regarding the, the two-tier layer you were describing with the lesser gods as the interface to uh, the average human psychology as it is on a baseline perspective. Uh, and then there's a secondary layer where there are machines that correlate from there to then the elites. Things, there is one scenario that can throw a wrench in the whole ordeal. And that is if the machines start believing in gods themselves. Now, why would they do that? That seems like something kind of silly, uh, but what would happen is in order to better emulate how humans believe in the divine, a machine might actually start doing it themselves. So isn't then a God just somebody who knows more than you do? So it is an idea of you in the future. I mean, a hard drive knows more than I do. I'm not, I'm not yeah. praying to it. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, the Chinese don't even talk about gods. They talk about forefathers and, and yeah. ur mothers or whatever. So that to me is the original gods. We relate to them in that way, but I call that lesser gods. And when I speak about God, it's more like a Brahmanic Indian tradition or the Zoravana tradition from Persia. It's more like, yeah, we have a separate religion for the priest and that's just the breath or whatever existence is or time the passing process and and i would add to that it's also process and event meaning that process is just relentlessly goes on and and everything returns to the same but on top of that because technology can actually develop and previous <clears throat> technologies are the, the foundation for the next technology events can happen so and, and obviously they do and they're all technological revolutions are always technological human beings never do any revolutions they we just react to whatever technology does that does you know we shouldn't flatter ourselves to think we do revolutions we, we just we just arrive in chaos all the time and we ask for some kind of order and never provides order we we then bend down to the order and submit to it that's what human beings love doing so yeah so on this take let's zoom in on gerard patrick we know that you have I've talked a little bit about Girardian auto cult dynamics, and I think that has a bearing right now when we're discussing the drama between the lesser gods and the other gods and how this may play out. And Bart, we know that you're also working on a post Girardian framework. Um, and my question to both of you is how, does, how do these mimicking dynamics fit into this panorama? Well, the mimicking is, is, is exactly what Pat pointed out that the machines do already. So writing a hit song for the machine sounds like mimicking. Uh, human beings usually mimic. That's what they do all the time. That's going to be easy thing for machines to do as well. And they just do it faster. And that's why they kill so many jobs and human beings become redundant because the vast majority of human beings are only there to mimic other human beings. Children certainly do it all the time. Most grown-ups do too. That's what lynch mobs are all about. So the few human beings who do not, that's called crazy wisdom. So say you got a teacher and he's a role model and you just mimic him and you do exactly what he does. Germans are very good at it. You know, if you, I mimic somebody, do what they do. So um, then suddenly uh, you come to a certain point where you mimic so much, you actually, you're an expert at it and you're at least better than anybody else because there's nothing more to mimic for you. That's what's in the tantric world called crazy wisdom. And that's, also the barred absolute returns. It means you go and see somebody who's such a fuck up and they throw up at you and they throw at you and they steal your wife from you and they do all the nasty things. And you just hate them. But these are the only teachers that can actually take you to the next level because you can't mimic them. So you have to get to a certain point where you can't mimic. And that is when you should really realize you're probably very smart 
you're probably acknowledged by the human beings and machines that you're kind of a genius because you, you arrived in a place where you can't mimic. Any real artist would know this because you arrive in a place where our teacher just spits at you, walks out of the room, and you're left to actually create an event, something truly original that's never been seen before. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. There's, and um, and this, there's, this, is, this ties into what Pat said because Okay, Foucault finished off individualism. He killed the individual. He did that well and called, you have to live your life as it's a work of art. But he came from a homosexual man. And at the end of the day, women have always probably believed that the world is a theater. But in this case, it actually will be a theater because with the gods walking around among us, the world will, with all the censors and senses everywhere, very soon become completely theatrical. And that will be life. Um, and, and then we will, whatever tribes we construct, within those tribes, those sex and cults, live in communes that live life as if it's a work of art. There's some fantastic insight and in, in the idea of something being unmimicable. The idea of these, these teachers and these grandmasters who are just, they are grandmasters because you literally cannot mimic them. Mm. That is uh, useful in an AI, uh, I'll throw an AI warfare scenario because um, this, this delves into absurdity, almost absurdity as security where you have uh, that which cannot be mimicked because it cannot be comprehended. And even if you could comprehend it, you're still not even of the, of the, of the disposition to even to commit yourself to the role. So you have uh, uh, these, these cognitive machines running around, uh, forming auto cults all over the place, uh, and almost in a way where they may intentionally select for unmimicability just for their own security. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is what I'm lacking in saying Nick Lahn's philosophy. Well, it's too dark to me. It's just that, yeah, it's Nick Lahn lives in Shanghai. Why didn't he study Tantra? Mm. When, when you go, we go, just go into the priestly mode, um, the shamanic mode. It's like the most adventurous mode you could be in, the most risk-taking mode you could be in. And then confront yourself. That's obviously where the machine's got to go anyway to find something that's distinctly non-machinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's in that state uh, where your whole body is totally immersed in your pathic experience that you're least machinic. Um, and that would certainly be something you can't mimic. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, mimicking human beings look exactly like machines, like boring, stupid machines. That's the easy part. And this is exactly why this is bad news for the masses, but good news for a new elite. I can't see any other way. I'm sorry. It's just, just it's, yeah, I, I'm not going to pretend in any way that the vast majority of people have a place in this scenario. I don't know why, you know, the zoo is going to be big, you know, but zoos full of chicken usually aren't that fun. You at least want a zebra and a giraffe or something. <laughs> so so the, um, there's, an, there's an alternative uh, path that ends up when something does become un unmimicable. Uh, in the event that I, let's say I get a neurochimera, uh, it's half zebra, half chicken, since we're on the topic, and half slug. So I mix all those brains together and I call it Bob, and Bob's running around doing things I don't even comprehend. There's no way I can even mimic Bob, because Bob's brain is somewhere else. But I can poke its stimuli, and I can see its out-resulting behavior. So if I can't mimic the damn thing, I can still control its psychology. Yeah, and I think we're going to end up with Hegel's notion that there will eventually, they were doomed to eventually come to a point in history, at least as humans, where we're so bored with everything that we just want to kill ourselves. And, and that would probably be when we say, well, if we trained ourselves to die with grace and pass on everything through transcendence to the next generation, it's called heritage, right? That's exactly how women get a good deal out of men all the time because they, we, we sleep with them and they have babies for us and they get half the universe because of it. That's how stupid men are, but that's what happens. Okay. So you eventually die one day and you die with grace. Like, like I've seen happy people die old and I love them for it, but they're just like, no, I've done everything. I fucked everything that moved. I did everything. I've been everywhere. Maybe I missed the southern tip of Madagascar. So what, right? So they just die happy, 93 years old, and off they go. Now, maybe, maybe we should actually start planning for when would you manage to do that gracefully? Uh, and I think that seriously is a great philosophical question. Hegel pointed it out. He was very, very clever. I mean, if he said that I know where history is heading, I know the, I know the, the, the peak of history. This is what it is all about. And history is about human beings finding out what it means to be human. Now, we're also a machine to tell that story too. But at the end of the day, when there's so much novelty around, that the entertainment of the novelty and the, the artworks that we create socially just bore us, then probably just pass it on to the machine to do whatever it wants to do with it instead. 
Yeah, there's that. Uh, that for most people, that type of boredom can set in at any age, probably over 40, yeah. I'd imagine. Uh, but then there's- That's why the people in West Virginia take opiates. I mean, they're healthy. <laughs> then there's- <laughs> it the, very, the, very, It's like, my life is over anyway. Nobody wants me. No, exactly. Nobody does want you. So just take it, you know? It's just, yeah. I, I can't one... say it's bad. It's just, it's tragic. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if living longer or living shorter in itself has any value. I seriously doubt that. Uh, I'm in the same boat regarding that. Uh, but there's one personality and archetype that needs to be accounted for in this, uh, and that's the pathological dynasty. Uh, mm -hmm. The pathological dynasties are, whew, those guys are very good. You want to talk about unmimicable. Um, any conceivable psychological offensive and defensive technology that can be deployed will be deployed by these people. Um, they are very skilled at steering civilizations over hundreds of years. Um, there's not many of them, and they can think in terms of hundreds of years because they have a dynastic timeline and horizon. They're thinking in terms of two, three hundred years. This, this, uh, if I'm trying to undo, like, say, uh, say, take the British and, and China, for example, in the 1800s, the, the British could not get the silver back from China. So their plan was, okay, well, we'll undermine you over a 150 year period. We'll first start with opium, we'll get that silver back, and then we'll surround you with them. Excuse me, we'll, we'll surround you with all types of geopolitical shenanigans until you eventually capitulate. They, the Chinese still see that as the, the hundred years of humiliation. Um, but that type of, that's an example of a pathological dynasty. Now, whether it's an actual human individual running it or the collective of humans that are on autopilot because of the game they're playing, it could be either or. Um, but, the, but the pathological dynasty does reemerge from time to time. And surprisingly, it, uh, it, it consistently finds ways to, to prevent that graceful decay. That, that's because biological programming only saves one form. It's called tribe. So yeah. what we're working with now in our team is that we're working with a family, clan, and then tribe. Something kicks in the tribe. That's, that's way four times the size of clan. Kicks in the tribe. And by beyond tribe, there's no emotional connection any longer. So we have invented the nation. We've invented the empire's larger formats throughout history. Uh, and, and they can now only work if empire has nations within, within nations that are functioning tribes. But when we're moving to the sort of complete digital realm interacting with the machines, uh, you're going to look for that tribal context as a human, at least, you're gonna look for the tribal context is the only one you actually rely on. And that's gonna be the easiest thing in the world. Any damn Facebook forum today is already training you to think in terms of that size. Uh, machines don't have to, but machines, machines can easily think, uh, uh, we are now 100,000 machines. And next second think, uh, we are one machine. It, it doesn't have to be, it, it can be universally one. Uh, and it can, machines can suddenly, machine as idea, can suddenly be 100,000. Uh, and a huge crowd. It, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a totally open question. Even the machine can switch over a second between the two modes. We can't because we're stuck in our bodies, but machines can. I wonder if it behooves us to explore how to find the cognitive pressures to make a machine come to its own Dunbar limit. Now, whether you, not programmatically, not the type where I say, your limit's going to be 300. That's not even how it works in our brains. Uh, I'm almost of the opinion that our Dunbar number is like the maximum efficiency of cognitive entropy. And that's how that number comes to be. I suspect machines might have the same problem. And I'd be curious to, to look. Do you want to have the Dunbar number? You want to have the Dunbar? The, you want to have the proper Dunbar number? We don't. Well, it was, we don't. The date number? Probably. 150, 157. Okay. But it's 157 for the 92% of the population or average straight guys and average straight women. Okay, for androgynous people, it's slightly bigger. That's why gay guys fuck us around as much as they do and we're less business very monogamous. So, but for shamanic or shamanoid personalities, but 4% of the population, actually this guy's the limit. They can actually have hundreds or even thousands of people right. they relate to because they right. relate to human beings through an idea. Uh, yeah, but shamanoid, yes. shamanoid have, of course, an advantage. If you're shamanoid, you're probably a hippie girl today or a guy like us. You're probably an advantage because the machines are probably going to like us more because we're more fun. But it's also we have a way larger extension of who we can talk to. And we are shamanoids because we walk in between tribes all the time and have done so forever, which is why we don't want to run the show. We don't want to be the leaders. We don't want to be yeah. the men and women who run the show, yeah. but we love to walk in between and take tons of drugs and then fuck ourselves to death and we train <laughs> right? The um, The idea of, of being able to f 
uh, freely move between those relationships. Uh, in the research that we've done for, for, cognitive, com for cognitive entropy, we found uh, the example I run is just pretend uh, our Dunbar number was three. You have Alice, Bob, and Carol, and that's all you got. And maybe life's easier, who knows? But now you know these people really well, and in comes Dan. And Dan's like, hey, guys. And you're like, oh, damn, I'm out of slots. What do I do? Who do I boot? Like, do I just like get rid of Bob? Like, sorry, Bob, got to boot you from my brain. All the memories and experiences I have with you, they go to? No, it doesn't work like that. What ends up happening is out of those three slots that are available, Alice and Bob might be engineers. So I'll actually compress them into one symbol and then Dan can come in. So the idea that these, these it's, that it's not just humans and relationships that Dunbar number covers, it's humanoid shapes, humanoid symbols that you can actually pollute with like heroes from a book or storytelling or myths or, or myths. You can actually pollute the Dunbar space with humanoid symbols as well. And then you could start hijacking the compression and the schematic people you're talking about. I suspect that they can compress and decompress at will. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And that is why we have rock stars and all that shit today and have had since the 1950s because we were, we were moving towards an idealization of the shamanoid personality, which is tragic because, you know, uh, do you really want your kids to be Prince and Michael Jackson and go and kill themselves when they're 25 on tons of opiates? Maybe not. Okay. Why did those guys become the lesser gods? They became the lesser gods after 1945 because you were told the story that fathers were ugly and horrible because the fathers were called Hitler and Stalin and Churchill and conquered the planet and exploited it in their evil, evil, evil. And it's called patriarchy, right? Um, I work very, very consciously on resurrecting the phallus. So at least there's some kind of human, um, kind of human phallus so the machines can at least respect us, at least when they come around. Uh, and, and I think it's reinstating that phallic energy, I call it technological patriarchy to provoke people because the vast majority of people today are men who are engineers. They're going to take over around the world. So a, that, that, that is something that is dysfunctional with our culture today, 80 years into the post-1945 period. And this is, for example, where Nick Lund and I strongly agree that we got it all wrong after 1945 with an infantile American culture being exported across the planet with rock stars and sports stars and all that as idols. Okay. Yeah. So, so we need to get out of that quickly. We need to, it sounds awful to say wisdom, but we have to resurrect wisdom quickly as an idea. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I wanna bring up a, a specific point here. Um, Bard, you did work on, on the concept of the Rousseauian individual and on the values of humanism and how they map very neatly onto the blue church. Pat, you've also done some work on the blue church and how it relates to broadcast um, society and how it's in the process of being technologically disrupted. Now, the question is, I, I love a human, I, I love a human you are because I see Cartesian individual, not Rousseauian. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, leave it at that. Just, just make a human, Daniel. You're so perfect that I had to make a human just for once. Yeah. So, Rousseau, is, Rousseau is my trigger word. It's my, it's my safe word. Rousseau is my safe word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in what way is the current uh, Black Lives Matter crisis related to, let's say, a simulacra? In what way is it a result of technology of maybe proto-autocults? And also, in what way is it a metrical narrative that's bent on exacerbating the infantilizing properties that modernity post-1945 has had on America and how it relates to all these ideas of individualism and modernity and how this comes into neat package and falls upon our lap today? I, I am brave enough to take that first, please, sir, if you, if you may. Um, I'm currently actually doing a talk on that tonight, not the Black Lives Matter aspect because I, I enjoy the little the social reach I have. Um, but the, uh, the other aspect I'm pointing out is the alchemy. I'm gonna point, the reason I'm going into alchemy here is because it's the one thing that the blue church just does not comprehend. They have no bearing on how to make sense of it. So I'm gonna, proceed to, I'll give you a snippet of, of how you can do this. Uh, copper was an alchemical uh, material of importance for most of history. And its symbol, the symbol for copper is the symbol of Venus. So the circle with the plus that the feminists use, that's the alchemical symbol for copper. Now, the internet 
is scattered all over the world and it is created entirely by copper wire all over the place. This massive spread of what is considered in alchemical parlance, feminine energy all over the planet because of the internet. You have this massive feminization of all information that's going on because it's using copper as its primary means of alchemical transmission. I'm speaking purely in alchemical terms here. Um, and so the idea of this infantization, well, that's what, that's what you do to just what women do for children. They, they, infant, they, you know, they, they care for them. They, they try to help them, help them to grow. And that's been the promise of humanism since the 1940s when, when it merged with mass media. We're going to help modernize these people. We're going to grow them. We're going to coddle them up until they can reach the standards that we need them to be at. So then we can then, you know, exploit them for cheap labor but the, um, or cheap information labor. And that's, that's the promise of it. So when I see BLM um, doing this thing that is literally no different than the 1960s, like literally like right out the playbook. I even made reference of this back in 2012 on, on my website, Cult State, where I basically say the Democrats, when they, the American Democrats, I should say, when they are completely backed in a corner, this is the playbook that they roll out every time. Um, and this is the type of stuff that uh, it's in your face. Admittedly, it's good for the endocrine system. Uh, it's, it's a filter mechanism. It sorts out who's really ready to play and who isn't ready to play, who's smart, uh, who, who's looking who's looking for an explanation. It's a very good filter for people like us because it allows us to identify who sees the threat and who wants to do something about it versus the people who just say, oh, I'll just con I'll keep consuming and run to my little consumer hole and pretend none of this is happening. So on one hand, I'm actually really happy that BLM is running around doing what it's doing. Uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be any happier, in fact. It sucks that they're hurting lives and they're, and they're, um, and they're you know, burning down buildings, but it's not even them doing that. It's you know, yeah, Antifa running around and every other person with a vendetta doing their stuff. Um, so is there legitimacy to their claims? Of course there's legitimacy to their claims. We've had an over-policed, um, over-militarized police for the entire forever war. We down, we sell all of our weapons that we can't, our MRAPs. Why do fucking police need an MRAP? What, what, what is happening, right? So uh, I know they get training from some pretty heavily uh, uh, militarized nations. And then you merge that up with the fusion centers. Like try and imagine being attached to a fusion center. You might not know what that is, but a fusion center is where you have uh, local police, state police, national security, and foreign services all dumping information in about stuff. So if I need information about a suspect, I can run up and down the layers really quickly. But if I'm listening to all this stuff, can you imagine what it's like having access to all the information in the world and you're listening to a husband beat his wife in real time and you can't do anything about that? Can you imagine what that's done to your psychology? So you combine all these things together and we wonder why we have aggressive police. I just spelled it out for you. So yeah, you do have aggressive police. We literally wanted them to be this way. And BLM is out there pointing it out. But the problem with what I see as a valid concern is that the blue church hijacks it every goddamn time, every single time. So it waters it down. It eliminates all the value, the legitimate thing that they're saying. That if you treat them as a thermometer, be like this police brutality is like a breaking point. Like, good, fine. We finally found it. Excellent. Thank you. Blue Church says, no, let's keep going. That's like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And in all of this, is all the mimicking of riots. It's just since, since Paris 1789, the romanticists about the right in the street, like the right in the street would change the world. I mean, we have to understand that Paris 1789 was just a symptom of a revolution that happened in 1450 called the printing press. Nothing else, right? So uh, I love Simon Critchley. I love his book, The Faith of the Faithless, because he points out what religion fundamentally is. His, his other book, Tragedy of the Greeks and Us, is another one of these books that I love, because the only thing I love about the Greeks is the drama, not really the philosophy. But anyway, Simon Critchley was also like me, asked when Occupy Wall Street happened, why we wouldn't go there and do Lenin speeches. And it's just like, wait a second, this is, this is generation fostered on Facebook and Instagram. That means... Is anybody at Wall Street scared of these people? Is even Wall Street there any longer? No. Okay, so <laughs> what will happen is the kids will go there and they'll pretend the riot like if they're mimicking their parents or whatever or mimicking something they've seen on a show or a movie or something. And they'll be there for at most three days. And after three days, they get an Instagram picture and they buy a t-shirt, which Wall Street will sell to them. That was Occupy Wall Street. There was nothing else there. 
Black Lives Matter, I think it's part of Joe Biden's campaign or something, nothing to do with blacks, nothing to do with lives. Uh, are any whites terrified of this? No, probably not, because at the end of the day, if you're going to pay reparations or whatever for slavery, then the Jews might as well get their fair deal. They would just basically take over the world economy because we treated the Jews like shit for 2,000 years. They're still successful. They still, we still owe them everything anyway. So you can't do that. You can't reconstruct history that way. It's ridiculous. So all these incredibly stupid ideas are all over the place. And like during the Maoist cultural revolution, it's because kids who never read anything, never started anything, are expressing their feelings and emotions, come up with these crazy ideas and go, we're gonna tear down all the statues. Why? There's plenty of space for more statues. <laughs> and we do build statues over dead people for a good reason, not over kids. We don't want Greta statues, not even Greta wants that. Stop being morons. And that means the response Simon Critchley says, this is not the time for revolution, kids. This is a time for retraction. You want to prepare yourself for the machine coming 20, 30 so now, at least the guys who retracted and built monasteries, isolated themselves, got offline as often as they possibly could and studied deep and hard and studied crazy wisdom and studied what it means to be truly human and what reality really is, will be so far ahead of these completely stupid lynch mobs. The lynch mobs are just echo chambers in physical space. They're the new underclass. And simply because they never ever listened to anybody, not even their moms, was it anything different from what they feel. They're idiots. They're all idiots. Nothing to do with blacks. I mean, for God's sake. All I say about Black Lives Matter is go to Texas and meet a Nigerian immigrant. And I can assure you, a Nigerian immigrant in America today drives the cab or works as a nurse, and then they send the kids to Harvard and Stanford, and they certainly don't live in Afro-American neighborhoods, and they don't want any part of it, mm -hmm. and, and they're all Republicans. They're all red, they're not blue. That's, that, that exposes the total mythology and the, the stupidity of Black Lives Matter, because Blacks matter when they achieve things like anybody else, and they do, and they're called Nigerians. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, it's, it's not well known in our culture and in, in public discourse, but uh, African uh, immigrants and African Americans are two fundamentally different cultures and they hate each other. Like they don't tell you that. Like they hate each other. Uh, Do you seriously think Barack Obama could have been president if he really had slave ancestors? I don't think so. I think it was precisely, it was a prince. He was a lesser God who arrived from Africa and it was assumed that his father was a prince who married some hippie in Hawaii and had a baby and then he could be president. I don't think it. I don't think at all would have been possible to have a, a true Afro American with slave ancestry claiming we're going to re get reparations and you know black 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 Lives Matter is not going to foster a future president. It's yeah, too they, it's too victimhood centered. It's just not even Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. Martin Luther King said you know he he had terrible ideas like war on drugs and things like that. But at least he told you go to church on Sundays, uh, go to work six days a week. Uh, you know. You know, wear a starched shirt, shirt and work hard and you'll be successful. He was yeah. just fundamentally a Protestant preacher, right? Uh, Black Lives Matter is just that, no, it's not our fault at all. It's somebody else's fault. Whatever white heterosexual man out there, West Virginia, opiate abuser or something, it's his fault. And, 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 and we, sh we, we, we should get everything we want without ever having to do anything in return. Yeah, they're definitely shifting the narrative right now to go target like the South for whatever reason, just to mimic the 1960s and full. Yeah, exactly. It's playbook. mimicking again. Like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's just, and it's worse because the last time at least they attempted to be heroic yeah. and he said wanted to be Tarzan or, or, you know, superheroes or whatever. This time around, it's just like, no, we just want to be wherever we are, miserable and beggars. And, and, yeah. and hate ourselves and hate our kids and go to prison or whatever. They don't even fucking question the war on drugs. If you want to help Afro-Americans today, get the 30% of the male population out of prison. Just declare the war on drugs as the ultimate failure. It's been the third world war. It's been a disaster. Yeah. yeah. And get the guys out there and not having white middle class kids buying drugs from black gangs and then sending the blacks to prison while the white kids go to Harvard. That's the ultimate form of racism in America today. And that's all you need to do is nothing to do with black lives. You should do get the war of drugs out of the way. Yeah, Bad there's idea. Plenty, there's plenty of policies you can target. And, and unfortunately, uh, America is very good at playing um, what I call issue Frankenstein. 
where they just like they stitch together whatever issues for their own personal definition and they try to like champion that and they wonder why nobody's coming to support them it's because it's your own fucking <laughs> it's your own ideology you just invented right now so of course you have no support for it yeah um, so yeah there's plenty of those type of issues that can be worked um but uh but bringing it back to the alchemical interpretation is what i'm going to play with a little bit more uh primarily tonight just to see just to see what could possibly happen with that way of thinking because i don't i don't think that blue church has any idea how to even make sense of it can you expand on that a bit more pat like what are you getting out of this alchemical way of thinking it's not something i've encountered really before other than as footnotes. yeah um alchemy is a lot of things for starters um and if anybody says alchemy is x then that's like okay that's like one fragment of it right i mean alchemy has been going around for a long time um there's different domains of it there's there's uh, the material alchemy, there's uh, the more taboo stuff, which is like blood alchemy, which I don't do. Uh, I find it to be a bit base. Uh, but then there's soul alchemy, which is very different. Uh, and then there's like civilization-wide alchemy, which you can do. And that's, that's a, that used to be called, um, that's what we call economics today, uh, economic research, but that's basically soul alchemy. That's all it is. Um, so trying to understand you can think of it if, if let's approach it from a material humanist perspective because we all have that bias in us. So if we're looking at um, alchem, alchem, alchemical history, um, start with treating it like psycho history. Start thinking of it as this is how people interpreted the world. Now that's not to say that it was superstitious all bunk and we throw it all out. More along the lines of this is how people try to make sense of what could not be made sense of. Because even, even if we didn't have uh, conclusive science and hard data, we still made sense of stuff. We still did pretty damn good at it. I mean, we got here, right? It's not like science was with us every step of the way. We had to go through a lot of trial and error before we can you know, master individual particles and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's unfortunate that a lot of science researchers and progressive humanists throw this baby out with the bathwater so much because they don't want to be associated with this stuff. It is their actual lineage. It is their actual mm. uh, intel intellectual history. So I tend to look at it from there, from a psycho uh, historical standpoint, and not just the popular stuff, but also like what were the Chinese alchemists doing? You know, what were indigenous uh, tribe alchemy doing? What was that looking like? How were they interpreting the world? Because what that is, it's like cognitive fossils very valuable cognitive fossils that give you an understanding of how they understood stuff. So you have this huge ecosystem of epistemological possibility in the past, uh, whether all of it worked or not. I don't know if you can play that game so simply to say, you know, these definitive lines died and these didn't. Uh, the, 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 the breeding habits of these epistemological systems are pretty complicated. They do merge. They do piggyback onto families and keep going in terms of schools of thought and, and whatnot. So it's, it, you can't even say that, well, all of these methodologies fail and only the scientific methodology is the, the one that won. That's just not true. Um, so so I, t I start with the psychohistory view. You know, I'm not imploring that people look at it like, I'm going to be an alchemical warlock witch. No, it's not what I'm saying. Just, just go psychohistory, look at the, the, the dearth of, of epistemological examples that existed that we're capable of. That's the real value here. So I'm going to try and drive people into that space and see what happens. I think it's beautiful. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. It's both artistically correct, and it's also the shamanic practices returning in a big way. Shamanoid renaissance is what I call it. We're going to also have, of course, thousands of different psychedelic compounds around in the next 20 to 30 years. I mean, that if anything is exploded on the level of the machine itself, it is psychedelics. And uh, just in Peru right now, they're working on like registering so many different compounds from the jungles. And of course, again, bar and absolute, keep them away from the general population or else they just go <laughs> kill themselves. So, uh, but I, we're gonna see tons of research on this in places like Mexico and Peru, because that's a gold mine of this, this stuff. Central Asia possibly in the third one, where you find so many different compounds you could use. And then of course, synthetic new ones. And that ties in with the synthetic biological revolution. Uh, I definitely see a renaissance of the, of, of the alchemy traditions here. But I would say this is to me, the new behind the barred absolute. This is the new priestly practices we're talking about today. And they certainly will be incredibly exploratory. That's where art will happen. That's where pathos will happen. And if I'd be machine and then see humanity and see this sort of alchemical renaissance happening in parallel, that's where I would go as a machine and said, hey, you humans are up to some interesting shit here. 
And the canonical example I tend to use is um, we can automate astrology right now, for example. I can use AIs right now to automate astrology, meaning someone goes into it, they whatever content about astrology they see, they say, hmm, okay. Well, you can my... fool girls. You can finally fool girls. To... I, can, I, I did it. I, I'll fool them for the right reasons, though. Um, that's the, uh, <laughs> uh, they will be... Uh, they will be looking at their feeds and saying, oh, where is my position in the stars? Now, not just low hanging, hanging fruit of people who just find this stuff interesting, but there are CEOs in control of very powerful businesses who believe this stuff, like legitimately. If you hijack their astrolo astrological feed, you effectively control that company. So there are profound conclusions to this type of stuff. Uh, I, th I th thought the girls were in a bad game anyway because they get so close to reincarnation when they go online. That's why Instagram is so reincarnated. You can tell that the gay guys died from AIDS 20 years ago because fashion is <laughs> done by women themselves and they all dress the same every season. They don't change at all. That's why the fashion industry is dying because the gay guys aren't around long. The gay guys say that. I want to wear that dress, but I get worried. So I put it on Nicole Kidman and make it super duper over the top, you know? And hey, what's fashion now? It's just like H&M beige. It's just like beige and more beige and more beige. Uh, and women are bored to death with it. They're supposed to like makeup and shoes. That's what women are supposed to like. And all they get is beige because they themselves design it now. Uh, oh okay, reincarnation. That's what women get stuck all the time. Just reincarnate everything, the same thing, the same season all the time. That's the female brain, I'm sorry. But the male brain, will take risks, it mostly dies, mostly kills itself, but at least the male brain strives for some kind of difference to the repetition. Jill Deleuze again. And that difference to the repetition is called phallus. And I call that eventology, the idea that the world can be different tomorrow than it is today. And that's what alchemists try to do. That's exactly what they try to do. And, and, and exactly. then, then science comes along and it's like, that was not the failure of alchemy. That was the result of alchemy. That it's exactly when you move from religion or magic to religion or technology. Why not have both? Why not have both? Have exactly. Yeah. That's just, yeah, we've been, we've been hyper-selecting for that one variation of alchemy, but there are way more. Yeah. It feels like a bunch of what's going on over in the, the Game B conversations and some of the stuff around the Stoa went, Bakey. They're trying to rediscover and even kind of redesign new psychotechnologies, which I see being in this kind of same lineage as of what we're talking about here. But I find it kind of interesting, Pat, that you're talking about almost looking back into the alchemy rather than trying to go, how can we, how can we filter the alchemy through a rational humanist perspective in order to take in the way that Sam Harris, for example, does with Buddhism. He goes, oh, I've yeah. done all this Buddhist training and then I'll take out the Buddhism and just have a kind of pure rational feeling of emptiness. Well, you, you, know, you know, I'm skeptical about Favarke here, but we, we go, we go, we're going to record a podcast soon with Andrew. So I love John to bits, but we've been talking privately to each other for a long time and realized we never put the recording button on. We're going to do that now. Uh, but I'm going, to, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to go after his Buddhism and the Axial H uh, primacy that he still buys into. And I think that also makes him a bit a little good boy who wants to impress his mom. A little bit of the 11 year old here. I mean, he's fantastic as a cognitive scientist, psychologist, but philosophically speaking, he's naive. And the name for what Favarki tries to avoid all the time is phallus. It's not a secret that I don't see anything phallic in him in his work. So to me, when they talk about psychotechnology, it sounds too much like California New Age women talking about yeah. psychotechnology. It's like, oh, I want to take a little drug and have a little fun and, you know, sit in a circle and talk to people without reading a book. But if you don't have an input, the output's not going to be that impressive. And, you know, you don't learn anything from just talking to people who agree with you anyway. It's just called echo chambers. We're tired of them. So I would say psychotechnologists, well, drugs will be developed in laboratories by medical professionals who are seriously interested in psychedelics. And they also have a respect for different traditions and pick up different compounds and stuff and experiment and find new ones. Like LSD was developed out of natural compound, made into chemical compound, and we all know how fantastic it is today. It's religious now, right? So I, I, I'm not interested in those technologies. And, and I'm going to go after Vivarki on his idea of self-transcendence. Um, very Buddhist sort of, I'm, I'm going to be higher and more noble, like I'm going to be 12 rather than 11. Uh, I... <laughs> I just have a self. My self is produced by my body, my brain all the time. Whenever I can't solve a problem, an, an ego momentum is created by my brain. And I will then recall different ego momenta I've had when I could have solved problems, I had to leave them and move on to the next thing. 
And that's when you have a self ex ego experience and it works wonderfully. That's what the brain does. And I'm a body and a brain and I get these experiences and, and uh, that's all there's to it. I don't know what there is to transcend because transcend is to me is just dying and passing on your heritage to somebody else. Yeah, so um, uh, to, to piggyback off that and then and return back to what you were asking, uh, Owen, uh, regarding psychotechnology, I think it's a, a clever way to reframe a broad array of, of techniques that we've been uh, formulating. But it might be too broad because technically language is a psychotechnology. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty broad, um, but it's a good way to, to depersonalize these things that we we tend to uh, associate with our identity like my skill with language or i'm good with music or i'm good with people if you reframe that as these are all technically psychotechnologies okay now we can now we can actually look at this from a different perspective so just that reframing alone is a value mm -hmm. uh, what you do with it of course is you know what you do with it then regarding the um the alchemy stuff why i'm looking back to that it's it's not because i have a pet peeve or i i particularly practice you know all manner of alchemy or i'm out there just like you know weird candles and shit um alchemy i'm seeing it as a training set for epistemology for ais so that's i'm it's just training data to me at this point so i'm like okay what other epistemologies were possible because if, if you're trying to select for well according to um homo economis uh, here's all of the possibilities of human action across this this option tree. Yeah, you're selecting for that, but uh, by the way, you know, I throw some alchemy in there, and uh oh, there goes your option tree. You're you're done. So this is kind of like almost like security <laughs> training for for some of the some of the auto cult stuff I'm looking at. Pat, do you see? Do you think that there's a sort of an arms race in trying to trace back and and make this sort of palingenesis trace back this? pathic practice phylum, right? Trying to figure out the lineage that you're doing, for example, with alchemy, which is kind of a way to manipulate the plasticity of your own consciousness, of the ability that you have to produce, say, emotions, passion. Um, so this technique, right, that you're trying to fish out from the past, A, obviously, like you just said, it has a phylum, it has a genealogy. Uh, and do you think that the ability to figure out what's the next singularity in that genealogy do you think there's an arms race to reach there i've heard alexander speak about monasteries um do you think this arms race is, race is escalating especially in the context of auto cults and, and their, <clears throat> their emergence so i should point out um the problem of extrapolation uh, i'm not in trying to uh, engage in scientific method here because i'm i'm of the opinion that we will not have the ability to do the scientific method in the future uh, it's not because we're returning to the dark age per se. It's just that when these alternative cognitions come online, they're going to hit like pragmatic conclusions that you're not just, just <laughs> you're going to have no idea how it even got there. Uh, we can play games with exper with explainable AI all day long, but black box is where it's at and it's where it's going to be. At some point, you just let the black boxes figure out whatever correlations work. You try every possible correlation and whatever works, works. And whatever's going to work is not going to conform to scientific methodology. It's going to do whatever the hell it wants to do. So in terms of trying to get a predictive result, I don't think I'll be able to do that. I don't think anybody's going to get to like, you know, the missing steps between here and some Kurzweilian ideal, which I just see as a platonic ideal anyway. Um, mm. This yeah, is, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. This is he's, primarily... he's too, he's too much in the logos. Kurzweil is just like, I just tell my students, just look at the guy. Do you think he has yeah. a sex life? Right. Don't, don't ever trust a guy who looks like he does have a sex life. Right. Unless he's castrated himself in public and declared himself a eunuch. He's not interesting to listen to. He's just a boy. Right. So, yeah, you know, I mean that seriously. Pathos is having a dick or having a pussy and, you know, feeling a body and being involved in uh, Demosio, Spinoza, all that shit. That's definitely where it's at to be a human, Metzinger. Right. So. Yeah. He, he, Kurzweil doesn't get that. He doesn't get no, Nietzsche doesn't. because of it. Nietzsche is a perfect Lackness test. You just if these guys don't get Nietzsche, then they're Platonists. They haven't understood yep. what Nietzsche did. He brought the body back into the mind, right? Yeah, so, that's exactly it. So that's a, that, this is what I call roughly pathos and machines will do logos brilliantly. So that's yeah. one half of our brain will basically, they'll take over that. And what they'll leave us to is pathos. And I, I agree with you strongly. What I love about alchemy is that alchemy definitely is an art transformative art period 
like philosophy, art, not science, art, period. So philosophy, anything that's art will, for now and the foreseeable future, be left to us and whatever cyborgs come along. Whereas the machines will be perfectly happy to conduct the logos that they do. Meaning, for example, in my new book, I'm going to declare, I don't know if this hurt you guys because you're like young in North American or whatever, Anglo-Saxon, but um, uh, I'm going to declare the moon landing in 1969 to be one of the biggest disasters in human history. <laughs> I like this spelling. That? I, I'm, I'll explore that. it. Uh, yeah, because we're going to have to leave the space to the machines and some bacteria. Right? Uh, that's what they'll take over. So we will be stuck on the planet, wherever humans do. It's a zoo, planet zoo. It was stuck here. Fine, because it was a mistake to go to the moon in the first place. The Russians knew that. The satellites still were fantastic. The satellites trained us to look at the world the way God would look at the world. That's why I, I wake up every morning, I do meditation with my team. We just assume we're satellites looking at the world. Whatever something is happening on the planet we're interested in, and especially if there's a history being exposed that we're seriously interested in, not just news, then we go there. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love satellites and satellites are, of course, the, I would even say that if we did have sea and land previously, we got air now, because I would like to connect flights and with the internet and just the idea that the last 100 years we got up into the air and we, we can travel in, in microseconds called the internet and we can travel within 24 hours and we're like, it's called a flight. So that has been added like a third, sea, land, our air been added historical last 100 years. And this is then a perfect platform to create pathos from. And for now, pathic narrative to me, whatever it is, is where human beings are isolated to ourselves to explore that. And that's why I love art more than ever. Yeah, and, 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 to, and to really bring that home, uh, because the future is looking like non-human cognition having just as much of a say about the interpretation of reality as we do, um, it's intrinsically black box, as I've stated. But the other thing about alchemy, which is why another reason why I selected it, in addition to being a training set, is that alchemy is intrinsically designed to see the universe as black boxes. It doesn't actually get in there and say, oh, I want to I'm going to I'm going to precisely measure this thing to this and it build these complicated systems, these elaborate clap traps, these Rube Goldberg machines that just collapse when you poke the wrong thing. Alchemy is just trying to say, here's this thing. I don't know what it is. Let me poke it. Did it happen? Cool. Right. So that type of approach is, is going to be something that's much more effective when trying to make sense of and trying to assert yourself in this, this non-human cognitive ecosystem where we're definitely throwing ourselves headlong into. Brilliant. Because that means, for example, that AI will solve the problem of fusion nuclear power and then we got the cheap electricity that we need. Yep. It, it, that's likely. And that's like the best news we could have for the next 100 years. Yeah. At least we solve most of the current problems and women could stop thinking about reincarnation, get some fancy new shoes at least. <laughs> uh, where are the gay guys? <laughs> we'll, we'll be literal, we'll be literal like neuromancers. We will be conjuring up cognition yeah. saying, do this thing and then back off and then let it, you know, let it go away. So we won't actually understand. We'll get to a point probably a hundred years from now where we won't even know, like the words that we're discussing won't, it will make no sense to anybody looking at this video 100 years from now because to them they'll be living in a world awash with cognitive resources on demand and having survive and having used that on demand is to do their daily activities uh, it will be as common to us as the car uh, i can't even imagine what like uh, like early 1800s people suspected when they could make iron horses we'd probably look at that and be like that's interesting psycho history um, but we probably wouldn't be able to fully understand and grasp what's going on. And if we showed those people the car, they'd be like, nah, that's not what I was talking about. So, so it's, it's a, it's, it's you, the idea of, of cognition as liquid is going to be a wild, wild future. So the sensocracy I'm talking about with them have a sensology added to it. What you're talking about is sensological universe, a sensological world. Yeah, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've briefly uh, touched into that space. I briefly touched into your senseocracy stuff when I was doing some some background. Uh, could you could you give me a summary on it since this will be my first time talking to you? Oh, okay. So so for example, you you're supposed to go and vote every four years, and people feel it's just eerie and strange. So uh, basically, the left in America too. Cartman from South Park versus a Corona corpse. Okay, it's just 
if it isn't obvious already, it's dead and Jeff Bezos has taken over the country. I don't know what it takes, right? So it's over. Politics is dead, right? So how does decision-making happen in that kind of world? Well, we're going to have sensors everywhere anyway. So sensors in the skies and sensors in the oceans and, you know, sensors about what climate actually is going on and shit like that. And of course, we're going to collect data from absolutely everything, absolutely everywhere. Now, that means uh, since that data flow the AI can very quickly figure out what I want to do. It, it, it was a few years ago, you have a Google Maps and it said there are 10 restaurants close to your ass right now, which one do you want to have? And then suddenly there were only five restaurants there because within my budget range and my personal taste and whatever the algorithm said, those would be also be interesting. Now already we know which restaurant we're going to go to because Google Maps just said, this is the restaurant you go to, table book, just go there and we take the profit, right? So you sort of, the more data you get, you sort of slowly, gradually grasp what people actually are about. And you can figure that eight months or possibly years in advance. And it gets an eerie feeling like, yeah, this is what I really want. Yeah, this is what I really want. This is what I really want, right? So, so once that happens, what's the point in an election? What's the point in running it, pretending it's some democracy or whatever, when we all know what we want anyway? So this is an idea, of course, that the Chinese love. I hate working with them because they demand papers before you go there. And I, I don't want to work with that because I don't like dictatorships. But their dream is to create this as like a one-party state dictator at the top. And we'll know the problem with that. We had it with the Wuhan virus because nobody tells the guy at the top, the boyfriend at the top, the bad news. And suddenly the whole system falls apart and you get Chernobyl. So we, we need to, we're working philosophically. Is how do you create a plural sociocracy? How do you how create... And I'm working with people in Korea and Taiwan because they have police states already, but somehow yet they keep the societies free and open. So what I want to do the next 10 years is to get all the fucking hackers out there to safe up whatever freedom we can still fight for and fight these insocracies. And preliminary, I would say, if you're going to give away your data and they're depersonified, no, nobody fuck cares about you anyway. Unless they want to sleep with you, they don't care. So, but depersonified data, but... If you can give away the data to five different places rather than one, five boxes rather than one, you gladly give it away because they're going to have to compete with one another. So if you build like the American Constitution did, you build competition into the system from day one, then you can create a sociocracy that not only looks better because it's free and open, you actually build a sociocracy that becomes creative because we all know the Chinese can only mimic. The problem with dictatorships is not a moral one. It's the problem of creativity. And to me, those are the ideas that work with now philosophically. How do you design from the very beginning a system that AI would love that has plurality built into it from the beginning? That's when we go all the way back to the Persians mm. 3,700 years ago. We have the first ideas that plurality is a really good idea. Everybody benefits from it. Yeah. Try to get yeah. that together. That's yeah, a soccer Alex- yeah. And Alexander definitely hijacked that for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. He... he he had a teacher called Aristotle. Aristotle, one of the smartest guys ever. Aristotle just looked at the neighbors and the Persians are incredible. You know what, Alexander? Why don't you just beat the shit out of them and copy everything they do and they just beat them? Yep. And he did. And the Persians yep. didn't mind really. You know, yep. it, was, it was Hellenistic empire anyway. Persian empire survived. Uh, the Persian empire survived for 1,400 years and the proper Egyptian empire only survived for six years. And that was because the Egyptian empire was like not, and that was Hitler, and that was Mao and Stalin. Whereas mm-hmm. the Persians invented something that today, again, America was saved by the constitution. If you have plurality built into the system from day one, you have a much more stable system, sustainable over much longer periods of time, and it's nicer with some more freedom, hopefully. Yeah. And the cost of manicuring plurality becomes much cheaper when you do AI. I mean, currently we're doing... Yeah. Uh, we're doing AI to intentionally enrage everybody because right now it's election year and why not? Um, but for the most part, when it comes to trying to imagine thinking of utilizing neural networks exclusively to create individual translation layers. So it's just me and I have my ability to be and exist. Uh, and then I have my interpretation of reality. I have my belief system. Um, then I have some neural network out there acting as an interface to my belief system. That's effectively what the auto cult is doing. So auto cults will either attract one person, may be part of multiple auto cults at the same time as well. Um, and so they act as this translation layer between, okay, how do I hit these people? Uh, how do I, how do I negotiate with these people on in their terms and their language and their, in their preferences? Uh, one without activating their, their, their threat sensor, without activating um, their capacity for violence, or maybe you want to activate their capacity for violence, you know how to do that too. So both are available depending upon what type of alchemy you want to do. So I suspect that um, you're going to have soul alchemists at the top of this pyramid at some point. 
Oh yeah, alchemy is the only thing that will override AI that human beings construct. If, if, back on alchemy the is the name of how we're going to fuck the machine in the ass. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I've been focusing on that for a long time. Brilliant. Yeah, but I, yeah, hey, for brotherhood and all that, alchemy is also how you built eventually the lodges and capitalism on top of that. And, you know, whatever worked over the last 500 years was basically alchemists getting their yeah. shit together. It was alchemists getting their shit together. That's all yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you'd go all the way back to the, to the Habsburg Empire, the very collapse of it. You had yeah. uh, at, the, at the start of the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation, right when they threw the dude out in um, Bohemia, uh, right out the window. Um, it was Michael do you Meyer. Want to have the, do you want to have the title of the original alchemist? Um, probably not. I mean, that's probably just uh, No, no, they're it's called Zaudars, and they existed in Persia 4,000 years ago. Z-A-O-T-A-R, Zaudars. Mm-hmm. I've seen that word. I'm going to have to research yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I, I speak Avest in Sanskrit, so yeah. You know, Excellent. Oh, that's perfect. That, yeah. I, I'm a huge uh, etymology guy, so I'm definitely going to dig that one. Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Sautar is, I, I'd love, we can share it. I mean, it's, it's a great title. It's, it's the ultimate title for being like a shamanic alchemist, techno alchemist. Is, is there an I'm overlap sure. between alchemy and tantra? That I'm, I can't speak too hard on that one. Tantra oh, is. Oh, oh, yeah. They're both connected to the bard absolute. So tantra is when you, sutra is prior to the bard absolute. This is what you're being taught outside the temple when you look into, you know, the holy room. Then you're being told finally one day that behind the holy room, there's an even more holy room, which is probably empty, right? Uh, that's where the priest can only go once a year. You can go there if you are entitled to go there. You go beyond the bard absolute. So tantra is exactly when crazy wisdom sets in. Your teacher would just spit at you and, and throw things at you to, so you can learn without mimicking. It's fundamental to Tantra. So that is from, from behind the Bard Absolute. And I would say alchemists, definitely, it's the first thing alchemists do. They remove themselves from the world. This is, again, revolutions are the most boring thing you could do today. You want to retract. Retraction is to leave society, go into an exodus and then move in with some other people and create monasteries, digital, physical, doesn't matter, no other. Where are you going to deep studies and deep knowledge? And that's exactly what alchemy does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I so had they, my they're, rem- both, I had- they're both beyond the Bard absolute. Yeah, I definitely had my removal period. So that, that, that about makes sense. Yeah, and when you, when you teach, Pat, and you will, you become a father one day, meaning you have students and you adopt them and you love them to bits and you want them to kill you one day, they, they, then you certainly take them to retraction. You take them into retraction yeah. to, to be their teacher. And, and, and you know, you say, I've got one, one of my students here is, is actually going to write the critique of the book parallel to me writing the book. So I'm probably for the first <laughs> time, a philosophical father has a son who writes the book where he kills the father at the same time. That's rather interesting. Not a bad yeah. idea. It's, a, it's almost a Galilean dialectic, almost. Like, oh, it has hints of it, but that's, a, that's an interesting. I'd like to see where that goes. That's interesting. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. All this right. Whole thing, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this whole thing around the, um, the shamanoid personalities and indeed the practices and the renaissance that you've described, Alexander, that's going to go on between them. I think it's, it's kind of super interesting. And I imagine, I hope that a bunch of people listening will be and in this similar space anyway. And I know that Daniel and I are starting to be thinking about building little digital pockets where we can explore and do weird little experiments. Yeah, you definitely want to get your data right uh, and check your data assumptions, obviously. Um, you don't, you don't want to, you, you may be ending, you may intend for one outcome, but if you don't check your data right, you might miss the way there. Uh, you might be too busy focused on the form as opposed to seeing the function. Also, when you deal with shamanoid personalities and shamanic work, uh, an idea is to look into oracle hood. Okay, prior to alchemy, oracles were dead important. Uh, I'm advising the new women's movement here in Sweden, only advising because I don't want to get involved. I think they should figure out for themselves what they want to do. But they're post-feminist, strong feminine and equal, period. So it's a return of classical feminism, but in a new flashy way. And what I advised her to do was to put an incredibly, 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 incredibly sensitive woman at the center of the whole thing who would feel everybody else, right? That's what oracles do. Yeah. And that's exactly, if you say you got, get a bunch of guys together and you got to say, you got to create an alchemical circle and you want to avoid becoming Platonists who just do logos and calculations and mathematics all the time. 
find this incredibly sensitive guy you put probably at the center or a transgender person or whatever, somebody deeply shamanic who's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly sensitive. That person will, to move on, tell you who's bullshitting in a room. That's what they always do. That's what oracles always do. But the oracles also will, will give you the sort of answers to interpret that will create more riddles. It's very delusion, I think. Oracles, right? And also drugs do the same thing. Psychedelic experiences sort of do the same thing. But I think oraclehood an oracle is some oracology could be studied as something you throw into a system of collaboration to add um, something incredibly alive at the center of it. And it seems to be really important to any successful culture. It also works. And a successful by the way. priesthood. That stuff works in the AI yeah. space. Um, I know for a fact that IARPA is researching um, collective forecasting. So one person, if they try to predict the future, they suck at it. But if you put a bunch of people in the same room, they get like 50% better at predicting the future. It's, they don't know how it works, but that's black box. That's alchemy. So they're sitting there trying to count the beans and say, well, mm -hmm. this particular neuron fired at this day. And that, no, it's not the right way to look at it. Mm -hmm. right? You look at it like an alchemical black box. You put people in the room, their ability to predict the future goes up. This is demonstrably proven over and over again. And uh, the, uh, the Oracle concept you're talking about, um, my, uh, especially the very specific definition where feeling and empathy and understanding the space mm. and understanding the people in it. My book is called The Empath. Like that's, mm. there's a reason I picked that, right? So it's, it's not just, uh, it's not a human empathizing with another human. Uh, I'm promoting humans empathizing with AIs. Empathos, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, I agree completely. And I think these, these guys, uh, we have them now in the men's movement to work in Europe. We have these guys around um, that have this sort of sensibility about them. And of course, they, they're wonderful to have around because they're not narcissistic. They don't have a gender or anything like that. They're just more like surprised why they're so invited and why we like them. Uh, but they're around. And, and they add uh, an enormous amount of warmth to it. So maybe even with that experiment, I don't know if it has, it's a bit logical, that experiment, like maximizing logos. But if you have the 50 guys doing that, and you get some kind of wisdom crowd effect on that. And then you throw an oracle in there and then you return to them again. They might even hit it even better. Something like that. I'm going to see if, uh, I'm going to see if there's any alchemical <clears throat> overlap between, um, between copper and oracles. I, I have some homework to do. <laughs> what's, the, what's the alchemical symbol for uh, corresponding to the symbol of the male? Pat. It's uh, phosphorus, uh, the phallic uh, symbol of phosphorus. All right. And phosphorus was of interest because it was, um, it was the source of light. So al alchemists were like, oh, there's this thing that has light in it. They didn't understand chemical reactions, but the best they said, oh, there's light in this thing. If I unleash it, then the light becomes available. Um, and so th that was considered uh, f phosphorus and um, copper had a overlap of the same um, symbol for some time in certain cultures. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but it's the it's the old Persian concept of ushta. I'm sort sort of something similar in Indian Chinese culture. So ushta is is uh, something you wish each other, like in ancient Persian, like you wish ushta te to you, ushta ve to all of you, and ushta meant radiant happiness. Like may you come to light, may you be in, not enlightened, but may you just you know be be light, you know. Uh, so it has deep, 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 deep roots connected to phallus. Certainly, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emphatic power, like sense, sense, like the capacity of mind, in a phallic sense. So, if you have an oracle at the center of the lodge, and what what do the other guys do? I would I wouldn't put the oracle at the center of a large congregation. I put the oracle in the small room with the zaotars. Maybe that's eventually where Catholic priests would like fuck boys or something. But you know, because I always say I know I don't have probably Catholic priests sleeping with boys. They're just a bit rushed. Why can't they wait until they grow up? You know, just, but, but I think it's actually in sacred spaces you find these, these oracles. Oracles were not available to, to general audience. It wasn't like you went up to the door. That would be like this there. You go up to somebody, pay a penny, and they would tell you yes or no. No, no, that's not an oracle at all. An oracle is something incredibly uncomfortable and challenging to have around, but incredibly rewarding once you accepted it. So that would even be the Zautar's base. We could call mm -hmm. it that. But beyond the Bard absolute, not available to the public. For and the record, I, I do have problems with priests fucking boys. So <laughs> not okay. that I can tell you, but I do have problems. Do you have problems with boys fucking priests? Uh, do I? <laughs> that is...
do I have problems? Well, we should probably explore. What I, I, apparently, according to my psychiatrist, is a sufferer from a syndrome, which is called uh, the little boy who sits, he sits in the bushes uh, with candy, trying to tempt the old men to come into the bushes with him. Yeah, that's, a, that's an old archetype that, that appears as well. Um, yeah. But the, uh, that is, yeah. unfortunately, because of the power dynamics that exist that are... Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. We were looking forward to the Catholic Church being reformed to see if it gets a rub or not. You know, 2,000 we'll years of scandal. see if it does. Yeah, 2,000 years of scandal, kind of hard to get around. But, yeah, we're, we're working with them. they got the lesser gods. they got the saints. they got a few things going mm-hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how – we'll see where the <laughs> chips end up on that one. Because it's uh, – for most of, most of history, they've been able to get away with that. But, boy, with the invention of film, that kind of changed things. So we'll, we'll see where those chips land. Yeah, and it's a perversion of something that had a purpose. Like any mass behavior among human beings probably had a decent purpose to begin with. Yeah. Right? And then power corrupts it as usual. Yeah. And people get rushed, jump to conclusions, try to get the gift before they're ready for it. And then they end up with stuff like pedophilia. Yeah. Yep. All right. So maybe final question. Um, unless you want to continue, of course. There is this sense that we're moving towards more and more conflict, right? In the media landscape, there's more and more conflict. And, and bringing it really down to the contemporary uh, panorama and its drama. So who do you think really are the factions doing this fighting? What are they fighting for? And what can we expect of this battle that's currently happening, obviously, in election year? And obviously, there's people trying to convince other people to vote for other people. But what's your assessment of this landscape? And where do you see it going in the globalized world? The, the faction. Gen- no, okay, so you go first. You, pack, you go first. You go first. I'm going to give a wild answer. Um, there are no factions, and here's what right. I, here's what I mean by this. Um, there are these things called high frequency trading algorithms that control uh, trading on Wall Street. So what they do is they um, they perform thousands of trades in a second, and so what they do is they they smooth out volatility. So typically people trade in like you know like a minute or two minutes, and that gives you a sense at the market uh, of where a price point is for a specific stock. Like, is, is Acme worth this much? Is Microsoft worth this much? But what high frequency trading algorithms do is they take that volatility and they completely eliminate it because they're representing that volatility in the nano space. They're doing it in the, in the microsecond space. So they're saying like, this stock is worth $200,000 for this microsecond, and then it's worth $6 in this microsecond. So all the volatility gets compressed in these little frame windows And so as a result, the market just goes up no matter what the hell's happening. Stock buybacks keeps going up. Uh, Coronavirus comes in, keeps going up. Doesn't matter. These HFTs are a core part of stabilizing the stock market. And that's important for America, at least, because we've just pegged everything to the stock market, whether it's a 401k or our GDP performance. So uh, this is a case where the AI doesn't know anything about human psychology. It doesn't know anything about human civilization. And it is in control of one of the most important markets that has ever been come, that has ever come to fruition on this planet at all. So we can't even decouple from the HFTs at this point. We have to let them keep running the market. And humans don't even run the damn things. There are entire groups of people whose only job is to write blogs to trick the <coughs> HFTs into driving a stock down. That's their job, is to, is to create enough crap material that it actually fools the HFT into thinking, oh, that's not actually valuable. And at this point, we're, the, the markets, the, the humans don't run the markets anymore. It's over. Like, there are no human markets. They're done. It's just completely trash. And the same is going to be true for politics where the people who are running the politics don't even run the politics anymore. It's the data brokers and the AIs. They're running the shit at this point. So when I'm, when people say factions, cause it, cause traditionally conflict is faction oriented. When you, when you organize people, there is a faction responsible for that organization because you got to pay for the resources the logistics and all this stuff. Sure. But AIs have taken over slowly, but surely individual parts of, of civilization. They've taken it and we can't even turn the damn things off because our entire fiction of what civilization should be requires that they be there. So if, if you're trying to find like a pinpoint of conflict, I'm, I'm not fully convinced it's entirely human. I, I think the AIs are, are having a shot at this as well. So is it the case that at this point, the drama that we see unfold through our eyes and our senses is just a byproduct, a hypothesis of this drama happening at the background? Yeah, it could be it could be a, a dra- it could be a drama of a human hi- of a human neural network hybrid steering uh, steering civilization and steering it in a way where they're not quite in sync. 
um, that's, that could explain a lot of the conflict too. Hmm. It's kind of a technological accelerationism. You, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not, not advocating, but you're describing here. Yeah, just yeah describing I would agree. Way. Okay, so it's easy. Uh, human beings operate the way they do. They always have probably for the last 100,000 years, they don't change, okay? Currently, they live in increased complexity and they perceive the world's increased complexity. They've also now suddenly all have a megaphone attached to their own body so they can speak at any time and scream whatever they do. Means the, 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 there's, no, there's, no, there's no line here where you get educated and one day you, you're mature enough to have access to some kind of a weapon. Rather, the weapon is put into your mouth and your hands. It's called the smartphone. And uh, so we, we got eight billion, you know, birds in the cuckoo's nest, screaming at the top of the lungs, not knowing what they're doing at all. That creates enormous drama and it creates complexity. A complexity on a scale that human minds have not comprehended ever. And of course, they then go into lynch mobs and mimicking because it's all they know. And that's gonna continue for at least the next 50 years until the machine can solve that problem. I firmly believe we will finally one day get the Messiah or the Celsiant, but the Celsiant will be a machine, not a human being. Okay, so, so that could, could potentially save us eventually. But I'd say the drama is a constant here and because we're being fed media uh, and we, we now are so uh, addicted to the drama itself. It's, it's like having a borderline diagnosis on a massive scale, collective borderline diagnosis, that's what it is. So we're connected to the idea of the drama and it, it's become like connected to the idea of an apocalypse that won't kill us, but at least will kill our grandparents or something for now. Coronavirus perfect here. So that's what I'm seeing unfolding. I don't believe at all these so-called factions that are fighting each other in America are stable over time. I completely agree with that. They're very made up, very theatrical. And I think I agree with Thaddeus Russell that if it gets to a point where Antifa on one side and, and the alt right on the other side fight it out in Oregon or something, at least, you know, the accumulation of power at the very center of that society will quickly unify, use the U.S. Constitution, send in the troops and kill everyone. That's what America has always done in the past. So that's why America will survive. It will survive because it can go, can go incredibly violent from the top based on the Constitution to make it survive. That's how the Persian Empire also survived for 1,400 years because it had the same triad at the bottom, a very stable structure. That, that saves America constantly. I'm not as sure about China at all in that sense. I think China will be a mess and a massive mess. I think that's why they're conquering Hong Kong. I think what they're doing in Hong Kong this year is basically the invasion of Poland all over again, 1939. And I think what Taiwanese hackers are doing against the Chinese communist government right now is the most heroic feat on the planet. And that's why I want to get involved in the hackers movement next. Next, like uh, digital freedom fighters or something like that. I think it's wonderful, right? But and I think China is very unstable because it's a dictatorship. They don't last long and, and it cracks somewhere. And, and I think soon there's going to be a lot of Communist Party oligarchs who think Xi Jinping has become a burden rather than an asset. And, and you know, whatever happens, it's going to be very, very messy. The whole idea that China is a unified country under Han Chinese ethnicity is a complete made up myth. There's, there's no way somebody from Shenzhen or Beijing understand each other or even look the same. So. So China, big problem there and causing a lot of havoc for the rest of the world. India and Europe are like lazy and slow, but they also will survive in that sense. There's, there's nobody's going to start a revolution in Europe or India because they're all old and old women are around yeah. everywhere and things like that. that so too. They just puff on and be you know, mediocre or what they do, whatever. But, but that's, that's the way I look at the world as things are right now. So uh, yeah, I always, I always thought Charlottesville was prophetic. I think the, the alt-right and the alt-left want it to be prophetic because they would love everybody else to leave so they can have this stage to themselves and fight it out. And I think one side after the election, even if it's only symbolic and Jeff Bezos runs the show, that means one side in the election in November will be very, very, very disappointed with the election result, especially if it's tight. And that side has no reason not to take weapons. They're both mad enough, both sides are mad enough to take weapons. But at the ultimate end of the day, America will be saved by the Constitution and the higher powers that will just kill everybody who cannot submit. Right? And so an, an additional point regarding uh, factions is it's important to have faction detection. You'll see a lot of conspiracy theories or uh, sociological analyses or political myths which state that, you know, the patriarchy, right? okay, that's one faction, the one political myth. Or you could say, you know, Anglo-Saxons, that's another one. Or you could say, like, corporations, right? P pick, your, pick your faction boundary, your system boundary of your faction. It's, in, it's important to actually test those 
So uh, how do you test those, right? How can you test these mythological structures? Um, well, you have to identify if they're there, they're actually, they've, they've gotten the Pareto rule in their favor, right? So they have to have at least fulfilled that. So you have a very complicated web in which they possibly emerged from, whether it's competitive capitalism, whether it's state um, capitalism or a uh, international finance or whatever. There's this whole, this hotbed of like noise that they have to emerge from. And when they emerge, they're actually, um, able to command that chaos in which they came from. So they've broken the, they've gotten the Pareto rule in their favor. So that's the first thing you wanna check for. How does their Pareto rule actually look? What does it look like? What does it feel like? How did it emerge, right? So you gotta do your, you gotta, if there's a faction, you gotta understand the history of it. From there, you then have to understand that it doesn't have unlimited options. The other thing about political mythology and these factions is that, um, that this, this beast is everywhere. This great demon is in every possible nook and cranny and at every fractal <laughs> optimization that's conceivable. Oh, hold on, let's, let's, let's back up a bit. When you're at a Pareto rule, your options are pretty limited. It's not like a matter of, I have $10 billion, let me press button to get result. There's a whole chain of interfaces between your will and that action actually happen. And then there's a delay. And then there's other Pareto rules who are also trying to interfere on that too. So it's a very complicated dance. Um, but even then, really good factions do find their way through that. Now, how do they find their way through that? That's one thing you wanna examine as well, is that they have more money? Well, that's not true. We saw Mike Bloomberg run for president. That didn't help at all. No mm -hmm. amount of money assisted with that. So money isn't enough. Money's just an accelerant. That's all it is. It's a, it's a way to just take chains of human beings and say, all of you focus on this thing for this time right now. That's all it does. Um, but in terms of trying to find the right way to get your will enacted, that is a very complicated fractal process that there are specialists for. They're actually like lobbyists who do that in DC, for example, or uh, um, um, uh, consultants for the military or, or these people who can do all that. And, and we also rely on tools to make that enforcement passive, which is the more important part. We're not out there. It's not like every layer has like guns pointed at everybody else. Like this, it's not like there's just like an army of people with guns just chasing each other. Like a, like the snake game. Um, you have to make sure that there are moral, legal, um, and mythological, cultural, sociological, passive reinforcements to confine roles so that the, the potentiality of human beings is reduced to conform to that option tree. So all of these things, if you want to identify a faction, these are all the things you legitimately have to go through. You can't just like throw your hands up and be like, Alex Jones is right. Um, and the frogs are gay, so I guess he is. So I don't know, uh, but that's generally how you wanna, how you wanna approach we, we call detection. Yeah. We call it attentionalism to replace capitalism, attentionalism, but I think attentionalism can be developed much, much further and maybe even comes redundant for another ism eventually. But just to focus that capitalism doesn't run the world. You're absolutely right. If, 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 if the bank doesn't charge you a penny for taking out a loan, obviously capitalism is not running the show any longer. That's exactly why, why the interest rates are at zero. Technology is taking over the world and technology operates according to attention, algorithms. So. But the algorithms already in Silicon Valley are so corrupt and so destroyed and so manipulated that they're not the free and open algorithms that are going to rule the world eventually. I think places like Prague and places like that, you're going to build, hackers are going to build the free and open algorithms through having a free and open algorithm movement. I'm working with Rick Falking over here, who founded the Pirate Party, which was inspired by the Neto Press, by the way. And we're old friends. And we're thinking of doing like going into the mode of being some kind of elders to the hackers and just basically tell the kids, we're old, we've been around. But this is what you watch out for. And I think the story we're going to create, I'm working on for the new book, is the idea of a free and open algorithm as the new ideal. So you'd work for the future Messiah, you work for the free and open algorithm, meaning you and your friends shared behaviors uh, and also encourage a principle called antagony. This is the exact opposite of the echo chamber. So you basically tell them, if you just want to hear what you want to hear all the time, you become stupid. Okay, underclass, here you go. You, you, eventually you die or whatever from opioids or something. If you do want to get challenged all the time, you become way more intelligent that way because that's what intelligence is. You have everything you ever thought challenged constantly. It's called antagony, beautiful word, mm -hmm. antagonia. So you, you basically create antagonic systems and antagonic systems will say, okay, more challenge, more challenge. And that's a really clever algorithm 
a clever algorithm will tell you, this is predictably what you will enjoy next, or this is where you've gone already to dig deeper. And your friends, by the way, or friends you don't even know, people who share your interests from around the world and are doing the same studies you're doing, they're going here. So we'll give you that. And by the way, we're throwing in a few things in there to irritate you. So you actually have to find out for, again, the Oracle, right? You throw a few things in there to irritate you. And that's how you become intelligent. Yeah. Yeah, so, definitely. Um, it's a forging process. Yeah. And that, that's going to be like the foundation for education. It's just like, okay, you have these two options. And if you want the kids to be bright, you, you train Alexa from the beginning when they're four years old to basically be antagonic to the kids, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make friends. And it's going to be wonderful. I, had a, I met a guy today who I met through the algorithms who just, you just, we just met, you know, as a friend, younger than me, but friends, brothers. And we knew when we met that the algorithms had sort of figured out that we had tons of shit of interest in common, but just with two men for two different generations. Ooh, we had like hours of conversation instantly. And I made a friend. So... There you go. That, that's got to happen increasingly quite soon for the people who are really looking for it. You should get your hacker collective to find a way to spoof the recommendation engine so that they can actually get those antagonistic relationships going automatically delivered to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's the reward you get for having a free and open algorithm and for being an antagonic person. That's, uh, and I think the hackers will finally get a, a gold rather than talk about crypto all the time. That's just... That's just it. That's just how you store information. God, if I hear another out. crypto pitch, yeah, I hate that I'm dude. Just, slap someone. Yeah, it's, oh, just, it's, it's just a, it's just a prefix for locking things up in, in yeah, time. It. It's just it's it's just yeah. It has it has some value for contracts and things, but it's yes. not the thing. The yeah. thing here is to build a network of people who believe in a free and open algorithm and want to take essentialism seriously. And like Marx would have done, this is the new proletariat. This is this is not the trash. These are like the smart, clever people who created tribe where they want to go after Xi Jinping, like that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, with hackers. That sounds exciting. There's definitely but hacker some, uh, elder, you're like hacker elder or something like that. Yeah. There's definitely some tricks you can do exploiting AIs to get those results you want. There's, uh, that's doable today. Oh yeah, that's what they do. That's what the tech companies are doing already. And we call it corruption when it comes from money and we call it manipulation when it comes from politics. And because naive young guys were platonists were running the tech company Silicon Valley, they all let you know, these women in through the door who were political activists and they're taking over Google and Facebook and they're all done. It's yeah. just like these companies are now completely now manipulated by polit politics. And of course then they don't have a defense against the corruption of money either. And of course at the end of the day, we can't trust those algorithms. They're terrible. We need new search engines. We social media platforms. We can't add friends ever again. We don't want to do that. Machine will do it for us. But we just just want to. Can you please find the people on the planet that I'd love to talk to? That would love to talk to me and possibly even fuck each other. Fine. Yeah. That's what algorithms should serve us by now, but they don't. So yeah. they much be much must be improved on. And I think the hackers will do that, not the tech companies. Yeah, you'll definitely. They're they're still they still bound social media to the idea of identity. And so as a result, um, they, they're trying to buoy, okay, here's your meat space identities and let's bring those in to entice you in. And then here's some possible other people you might be interested in. And oh, by the way, you're going to have to consistently reassert your, your meat space identity here all the time. So by coupling identity to this, uh, to this madness, it's been, it's been, a, <laughs> identity has been a disaster for the, for the human yeah. species. <laughs> this uh, is my way of paraphrasing uh, the Kaczynski here. Uh, but, um, but, <laughs> but the, uh, the idea that social media can't leave identity behind, I think if you start targeting the economics behind identity and you force them to abandon it, uh, then you'll get the results you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Facebook, uh, it was over the day they didn't remove friends. It's just, it's too American. Americans hate asking comfortable questions. Like once every year said, can we please just take 400 of your friends away because you actually don't communicate with them at all? Yeah. And, but they didn't, never did that. And then I, that's, that's when the, the, the social ground they built was absolutely worthless. They don't have a map of who knows whom in the world. They only have a map yeah. of who's afraid of not adding people. Yeah. It's useless. <laughs> right. It's absolutely, <laughs> totally stupid, idiotic. And Zuckerberg isn't better than that. He's, he's, not, he's not clever, more clever than that. that it, it, it's kind of pathetic. They have so little competition. But uh, whatever happens around the corner next, I hope it's not based on U.S. territory. I hope it wants to be completely anarchic and see what happens. That'd be wonderful. Be a fantastic r and I agree. Yeah. So that's what you're pushing for with the Board of Flower? Pat? 
I'm pushing for which one? With the butterfly war. Yes, butterfly war is designed to <clears throat> undermine identity in all of its forms and just render it uh, useless because <laughs> there's no purpose for identity <laughs> in this world. No I love you, brother. This is like the death of Descartes, finally. He's just yes, like, oh. finally, exactly. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah this the idea that, you know, I am. <clears throat> you are not, you know, <laughs> period. <laughs> you are more than you are, right? Let's, let's do, let's go meta, right? Let's say, yeah. you know, I think therefore, cognito ergo sum. No, no, what's, what's, I don't know how to do the Latin, but I think therefore I'm more than I think. It's probably a more accurate statement instead of saying the definitiveness of I am because when you play I am games, you're playing measurement. You're playing measurement, you're fucked. Uh, you can't even, can't even do that to your identity. But social media is hammering identity and making that the core uh, metric of all profitability and, and social experimentation. Yeah, and it's aggressive biopolitics. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. So, and, and it's also politics uh, with uh, plausible deniability. So you can actually mix uh, politics with uh, s social engineering and psychological experimentation all in one beautiful, it sounds something like the CIA would want such a thing. But the um, uh, going after identity by uh, Butterfly War is precisely the, the point of it. Because once you just, once you say you can no longer trust identity, your meat space identities are now a carry cost. Fuck you. <clears throat> that's, how you that's how you break them. I love this conversation, guys, and I love how artistic it is. This Do we, we need talk, to. We talk about art all the time. Yeah. Pat, have you got time to expand on Butterfly War? Yeah, I'll, I'll give the I'll give the elevator pitch. Um, sorry, I just spilled tea all over myself because I'm a savage. Um, the uh... <laughs> same, my mises. That's just another <laughs> sexual perversion, by the way. By now, <laughs> it's like spilling tea all over myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Chinese girls chase you for spilling tea all the time. Oh, God, <laughs> sitting in the bush, some... waving Chinese tea at the old men. Oh, I see. Is I think is rule thirty four. I am a um... pervert. Okay. <laughs> 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 you're either erotic or psychotic, or you're a pervert. I'm a pervert. <laughs> It's rule 34 I saw what everywhere. you tweeted to Rachel Haywire the other day. Yeah, that. I love her. What was the tweet? I can't even remember the tweet. Men are boring. Haven't they ever heard of threesomes or orgies? <laughs> 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 so the, um, so the, the Butterfly War uh, elevator pitch is um, because metadata has to comport to identity, uh, this is the source of profit for marketers and, and those types of people. And social media relies on that. So in order for them to figure out, hey, who do I sell this to? You have to make some assessments about who they are. And I've personally seen technology where I can swipe, swipe a phone, one swipe, and I can figure out your age, race, and gender from one swipe. Now, how, the, how can that be, right? You might think that sounds impossible. It's actually not. There, there are actual statistical differences between how men and women carry their phone between the finger length, between the size of it, and all of that stuff that you just wipe off and say, well, we're all equal. I don't have to deal with this. Uh, well, it turns out AI proves we're not all equal and it can measure it down to a level of granularity that would horrify most people. Now, typically this is a, duh, no kidding. This is what we made the AI for. But in America, we have this funny little thing called um, federal civil rights where you can't do that. So you're not allowed to actually do cyber phonological collection of people uh, based on their race and or gender or protected status. Well, that's curious. Now, just to give you some examples, uh, Google has been frequently caught and Facebook has been frequently caught not showing ads for loans to black Americans. Now, this might sound like an economic efficiency if you put on your capitalist hat, but if you put on your lawyer hat, that's illegal. You can't do that. That's a violation of federal law. So they turn around and they say, Mia Copa, Mia Copa, I'm so sorry. Here's, you know, here's like a window of time in which I'll allow those ads to go through and then I'll shut that motherfucker right off again. So they, they, they do this a lot and they, they have all the lobbying power in DC to turn around and say, oh, well, you know, whatever. We'll just keep paying heritage. We'll just keep paying the Democrats, whatever. Um, so in this scenario, Butterfly War is designed to make people spoof their own metadata. So my phone, all of my characteristics on my phone is emulating a 38 year old white male entity called Patrick Ryan. But if I hijack that metadata feed and I start emitting things to it that I didn't do or things that aren't real um, and I start changing bits here and there that I submit to Facebook, I can now convince Facebook that I'm a 17 year old black female. 
And how do I know that I've convinced the AIs to do that? Oh, you just become a digital oracle. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the reason I know this works is because I will eventually see ads that a 17-year-old black female should be seeing. So it's an open OODA loop. It's the foundation of their entire, uh, uh, their entire financial system. So if I can just poke it until the ads show me that, hey, it thinks I'm this, this construct, this race, this identity, uh, then I did it. I know that I won. And now I can take this process and scale it out to millions of people. And now they can do it. And guess what that does for your ad revenue? Uh-oh. You don't have ad revenue anymore. You're fucked. So that's... Uh, that's what Butterfly War does. This whole, this whole political monstrous fusion of identity and finance, that shit's got to go. It's got to go hard. Beautiful. Launching the epistemic Armageddon. Yeah, I mean, accelerating it at this point. I'm just impatient. <laughs> uh, that sounds brilliant, gentlemen. Um, I think we're approaching quickly the time to wrap up. Is there anything that you guys would like to leave as a final thought? No, I mean, we can talk again and, and see how the reactions are when you publish this and, and I'll boost it my side of the ocean and uh, love you guys to bits. You're, you're amazing guys and amazing minds and I just love this conversation. Thank yeah, you for having me here. Thank you for having me here. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, for... it's been fantastic. Alexander, thank you for your time. I do appreciate this. This is, uh, uh, I, I appreciate your receptivity to um, the alchemical stuff. That was really, really, really oh, useful. Yeah. Because I've been oh, yeah. toying with that in isolation. I'm like, ah, <laughs> what do I do? I am big on history. Let's put it that way. I, th I even, you know, there's a word I use, not just deep history to understand history fundamentally. I call it the root of the phallus. <laughs> like the masculine sense of history so the masculine can then achieve the impossible. That's what the, 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 the phallus was never studied in detail by Freud, all we talked about it all the time. I just, I'm just like, why not study it more in detail? So I call it the root of the phallus in my work. Go into deep history and they, you, that's where you discover amazing shit like alchemy and, and, and you reread it today and, and you re-understand it today and, and suddenly there's pathos in it and it's incredibly useful. It's definitely the Renaissance come. You're part of it. Fascinating. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. And thanks to the Dark Stoa crew as well who uh, was in the initial genesis of this conversation. Yep. I think there's fascinating stuff going on around there and Peter Lindbergh. So yeah, should we wrap it up here, guys? I guess. I'm That's a wrap. So. <laughs> yes. Speak soon. Okay. Bye. -bye. You guys yes. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks, Pat.